Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode here at the Damage Report. A big old Thursday pack chock full of news, news from the house, news from the SCOTUS, news from the leaked photos, I guess, that they have from Hunter Biden's phone. I don't know, we got a lot of news that we're gonna be talking about and we are of course, well, you'll see why it's of course. We're gonna be delving into Griff Nation, a brief trip, see what's going on there, what their customs are, their traditions and our guide on this trip to Griff Nation will be, as always, Dan Evans. Dan from the internet, welcome back to the Damage Report. Yes, news from a lot of a lot of places, and Dan from the internet joining you right there. Exactly, in perfect harmony. Let's go. Uh, making this the Danage Report, which I'm always excited for. Uh, we're always glad oh, to yeah. have you here. I like to remind people pretty much every time you're on that way, way back when the Damage Report was just a tiny little thing. Uh, Dan was a producer on the Damage Report, helping to make it the show that it is. So blame him, honestly. <laughs> but anyway, Dan, it's great to have you here. Uh, if people aren't familiar with your work, can you give them a little update on uh, on what you do when you're not uh, on our show? Yes, um, so I do a show called Power Report. It's a podcast that's very, if you're into Damage Report, this will be a wonderful supplement to it. I do it pretty much every other weekend. Um, just follow me at Dan from the web on Twitter to get more info at that or youtube.com slash Dan from the internet. And we're gonna be talking about music later on and I happen to, so I don't go super mad, do a music podcast called Audio Face and same thing. Just follow me on Twitter at Dan from the web or go to youtube.com slash Audio Face pod for that because I do that every week and it's yes. pretty fun. Nice. Yeah, no, uh, Dan is right. Uh, the ban on music news is going to briefly be waived at the damage report. Uh, all of you in the chat, what are your predictions? What story would it take for us to talk about music on the show? Let's get your predictions. We almost talked about the, about the Billie Eilish thing earlier this week, but we didn't get to it. But anyway, thank you everybody for being here, regardless of where you're watching. We appreciate you sticking with us. Stick with the show, stick with the network. Um, during these these middle days between elections, when the news isn't sexy enough to bring out of hiding the people who are only sometimes interested in politics. Thank you so much for being here. Would you mind hitting the like button, sharing the stream so, so that people know we're live? That would be great too. And as we go through our now nearly 90 minutes of news, if you have questions, comments, concerns, anything like that, uh, you can send them to us and we'll talk a little bit during our breaks. Um, if you have anything deeper than that though, we've got a special opportunity for you. It only comes once a month and that is our tier three member Q&A. So that is happening today, 12 p.m. Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, members of tier three at, on YouTube can join up, we can talk, a little bit of politics, mostly non-politics. It's fun, we hang out for like a half an hour every month um, and just sort of catch up. We do a little bit of behind the scenes talk. So all of that is available if you become a tier three member or upgrade your membership as well as the all of the past ones that we've done are available too, where we get into a ton of different stuff. So all that is waiting for you, but you know what else is waiting for you? The news, Dan, should we make them wait no longer? I mean, you're the host, I, I would like to do your role for you, but let's see how it goes. It's the Danage report, it's up to you. Anyway, with that, let's talk about what's going on over in DC right now. Nancy Pelosi had really been wavering over the past week or two on whether they're going to do this select committee to investigate the January 6th incident in DC. It wasn't what they would have preferred as we'll get into. But as of this morning, it is going to happen and here is the speaker announcing it. With great, With great solemnity, solemnity and sadness. sadness. Uh, I'm, uh, announcing I'm announcing that the that House will be establishing, establishing a, 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 a select, select committee, committee on the January, on the January 6th, 6th insurrection. insurrection. Again, Again January, January 6th was one of, was the, one of the darkest days in our nation's, in our nation's history. history. I've said it now three times. times. It, is it is imperative that we establish the truth of that, of that day, day and ensure, and ensure that, that an attack of that kind cannot, cannot happen and that we root out the, out the causes, causes of, it of it all. On the... It Okay, um, so yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna mess with the audio there. We're having a little bit of issue with Echo, but we're gonna see if we can get that solved. But anyway, Dan, there you have Nancy Pelosi seeming like it's the last thing she wants to do. She seemed like super reluctant there when this is totally something that she has been pushing for. But anyway, they are gonna have the select committee. 
This is of course because Senate Republicans just last month blocked the creation of an independent commission. Um, despite 35 House Republicans voting in favor of it when it was in the House. And so uh, that was going to be a bipartisan commission, literally split 50-50 between Democrats and Republicans. They said no to that, and so now you're gonna have the select committee, which is likely to be a little bit less bipartisan. What are your thoughts, Dan? Yeah, so I think you illustrated it really well there, that Nancy Pelosi seemed almost like reluctant to say that, okay, it's not the best thing we can do, but we're going to investigate this terrible act. I mean, it's definitely good that there's gonna be some amount of accountability. I mean, on the flip side, and this will get into my broader point, the Republicans made such a hay out of Benghazi and Hillary Clinton and everything that happened there. And yeah, maybe that all wasn't like the best situation, but this is, we're doing this sort of like trauma downplaying with what happened with January 6th. Like we're trying to move past it because it's beneficial to the Republican Party's electoral prospects to move past it. But mm-hmm. this was an attack on the US Capitol by like members of one political party is unprecedented in the United States. And these actors are still very much in the like our political discourse right now. They're in the country, they're gonna be running for office. Um, this year in smaller elections and the next year in the midterms, all right? So this is important that we do this. And it's very clear that Republicans are just like not really interested in showing accountability for this measure. You have the House Republicans there, but that was I think very early on when it was still kind of the jury was still out whether the Republican Party would ditch mm-hmm. Trump or not. Now it's pretty clear that the Republican Party is going to be riding the Trump train as long as it'll take them. But overall, it is another case in which I am really concerned with why the Democrats still like have their gloves off, it seems. Like they did not realize that they're going to be obstructed and stopped in any way possible. So they should just use the same powers and like forcing things and do any sort of like random measure they can to get as much of an eyeball on this issue so they can continue making a conversation. Mm-hmm. Just to use as a rhetorical strategy, just the way the Republicans make anything out of nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, a little bit mixed. I, you know, I, some sort of bipartisan commission would have had the downside of uh, that the Republicans would have inevitably stopped it from accomplishing literally anything. That would have been a downside. But it would have at least, it would have felt for a minute like there were some Republicans in the Senate at least that could look past their fear of an even Twitterless Donald Trump to do the right thing. And we didn't get that. So that sucks. Um, That said, I know a lot of people even before that vote were very concerned with what some of the recommendations might be that would come out of a commission like this. Um, Would it lead to some sort of you know, quasi sequel to the Patriot Act, some sort of either more locking down of DC or investigations of groups that go far beyond the Stop the Steal groups? I I don't know, that's still a possibility here. and look, if 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 your concern about this as a Republican is it will be used to make us look bad, well, so it, there's two things. One, it will make you look bad because it's bad, and your unwillingness to take it seriously that by itself should make you look bad. That said, yeah, they're probably going to try to keep it in the news at least partly to make the Republicans look bad. That is part of politics. I don't like it. I don't like it when the Republicans did it for 150 years during the Benghazi hearings that they had. When you had people like um, Kevin McCarthy literally saying, isn't it awesome that like that being in the news hurt Hillary Clinton in the election? Like that, that, so them saying now that that's what they're concerned about is a little bit of projection, a little bit of fear that's gonna be done to them what they did to the Democrats. That said, I wish that we could get something, whether it was the bipartisan group or the select group, that would just be an objective look at what encouraged this. And more importantly, why wasn't seemingly anything done ahead of time to make it less violent, less damaging and destructive um, than it was. Yeah, I, I agree with you pretty much. My one point to that would be that the government is already unfortunately on this path already where they are um, increasing their sort of dragnet of intelligence and scrutiny and security, including you know socialists such as like what Ken Klippenstein reported in their dragnet of intelligence along with right wing extremism and like far right nationalism. So I think some of the fears that oh maybe some of the recommendations of this commission in 
could lead to an increased surveillance state. I think we're already there, and I think it's going to be happening regardless of what little Congress can possibly do to extend that, right? That's a yeah. separate but very important battle there. Um, but this sh- sh- is a really good rhetorical like layup, I think. The Democrats should play this out as long as possible to stay on the offense, to force Republicans to be on the defense for a change, and to distract them as well, because there's infrastructure deals, there's voting rights stuff, there's filibuster mm-hmm. stuff, probably not likely there's reconciliation. This is also like an information battle as well. It doesn't seem like the Democratic Party is equipped to do that game as well as the politics of it. And they're not really good at yeah. the politics of it, to be fair. No, no, they're, they're certainly not. Um, but one one related little thing that I want to throw out that we didn't get to yesterday was um, there has been the first sentencing related to January 6th. This is a 49 year old Indiana woman, um, uh, Anna Morgan Lloyd pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor count of demonstrating inside the Capitol. She was sentenced to three years of probation. She has to perform 40 hours of community service and pay $500 in restitution. Um, I, I'm, if that happened to me, I would consider it pretty annoying. But it's also not, this is not in line with the way that, for instance, Tucker Carlson has been talking about this, that um, and they're hunting down everybody and their families are gonna lock them up and they'll never see the light of day. Like That's not to say that we shouldn't have concerns about how that event might be used by people who weren't a part of it. But at least with the first sentencing, it doesn't, look like they're going as insane as the United States justice system sometimes does. So we'll see, we'll see, there's gonna be hundreds of other people. I mean, there were 10,000 people at the Capitol, there were 800 who broke in. There's gonna be a lot more sentencing, but so far it looks fairly restrained, I think. Yeah, from what I heard really fast, I'll just say that I think the judge in that case said that this is one instance where they'll be kind of light on the sentencing, but it's not shouldn't be expected for all the cases. So again, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly gonna come down to what evidence they actually have. I mean, maybe this woman just broke into the Capitol and rampaged around. If she didn't steal anything, if they don't have footage of her breaking things or chanting, you know, murder the vice president, then that's gonna help for those who did that. It might be a little bit rougher on you. Anyway, let's move to something related though. <clears throat> on the, on the issue, issue of critical race, race theory, theory etc. Et I'll, I'll obviously have to get much smarter on whatever the, whatever the theory, theory is. is. Um, but I do, but I think, do it's think it's important, important actually, actually uh, for, for those, of those of us in uniform to, to be open-minded, be open-minded be and be widely read. read. And the United, and the United States, States Military Academy is a university. Uh, and it is important that we, that we train, train and we and understand. understand. Uh, and I, and I, I, want, I want to understand white rage, rage. And, I'm white. and I'm white, and I want, and I want to understand it. it. So, so what is, what is it that caused thousands, thousands of people to assault this building, building and try to, and try to overturn the Constitution of the United States of America? What caused that? I want to find, I want to find that, out. that out. I want to, I want to maintain an open mind here, here. and I do want to analyze it. It's important, it's important that we understand that because, because our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Marines, and Guardians, they come, they come from the American, American people. people. So, it so it is important that the leaders, that the leaders now and, and in the future, in the future do, understand do understand it. it. I've read, I've read Mao Zedong. I've read, I've read, I've read, I've read Karl, Karl Marx. Marx. I've read, I've read Lenin. Lenin. That doesn't make me a communist. So what is wrong? With understanding, with understanding, having some having some situational understanding about the country for which we are here to defend. And I, and I personally find it offensive that we that are, we are accusing, accusing the United States, United States military, military general officers, our commissioned, our commissioned non-commissioned officers, officers of being, of being quote, quote woke or something, or something else because we're studying some theories that are out there. That, are out there. that, was, that was started at Harvard Law School years ago, years ago and it proposed, and it proposed that, there that there were laws in the United States, States anti-bellum, anti-bellum laws prior to, prior to the Civil War, war that, led that led to a power, a power differential with African Americans that were three quarters of a human being when this country was formed. And then we had a Civil War and Emancipation Proclamation to change it. And we brought it up to the Civil Rights Act in 1964. Another hundred years to change that. that. So look, so look I at I do want to know, and I respect, and I respect your, your service, and you and I are both green berets. berets but I want, but to I want to know. Okay, so I was going to make a joke about us wanting to sound like it's a speech being given in a baseball stadium, but Brooke beat me to it in the Twitch chat. But anyway, um, we're going to get to all the content of that, Dan. My favorite moment, I think, is going to be a lot of people's favorite moments. Do you know what that is? Um, Matt Gates's crud eating grin at yep. the middle of that. It's him being, and I'll I'll put it this way, uh, him being a poop bird. I'll say um, on camera, his <laughs> dude, like you are, you should be enjoying these days. You're going to jail, man. 
you're still in public. Why are you so angry all the time? This is freedom, enjoy it while you got it. That said, um, Dan, there was also some substance to uh, what Mark Milley said. And by the way, I, I like I like almost all of what Mark Milley said. I think it was good. That said, he's a general in our military. I'm not doing this video because I'm like, he's the best. <laughs> 10 out of 10, no more crimes. I, I don't know, but I like this clip at least. So Dan, what were your thoughts? Yeah, caveat aside, this is not gonna be some sort of like um, whitewashing, no pun intended, of the US war machine here. Um, trying to put some like plays in intersectionality while it battles for relevance on the world stage, all right? But that being said, we have come from an administration and a lot of previous sort of times where, and a lot of previous instances where it has been pretty clear that the um, armed forces have at least some racial, racial issues. I mean, there was the, I think, Latina woman in Texas last year who was like killed at a um, military station, like base and in, in Texas, and no one really kind of talked about that case, but it was one of many sort of undercovered cases of people of color being really abused within the armed forces. And so when it's getting mixed with all of the cancel culture, like critical race theory stuff that is the only thing the right wing really has the ability to talk about at this point, because Joe Biden has gotten rid of a lot of the major scandals. All they can talk about is Hunter Biden and his chocolates or you know cancel culture and Dr. <laughs> Seuss. So it's like, they're really just digging at the bottom of the barrel here yeah. for content things to talk about. And they're talking about a legal theory that is pretty accurate and was taught in colleges and going back 20, 30 years ago. But now yeah. it's starting to come into um, and instances in America today where people are learning more about redlining and other institutional measures that kept people of color like down and harder for them to build generational wealth and success in this country. I, I think that was a really excellent case. And the best thing I'll say about that general there is that he stood toe to toe with white fragility and actually was on the good side of it. Because all of these are just things that are used to stoke the fears of an honestly aging sort of like European like center in America society. And what that is doing right now is, well, what that general did is combating that measure and saying, hey, it's part of America to learn about things. It's part of intellectual curiosity to learn about things. So let's just approach it from that perspective yeah. as opposed to taking it as a threat. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, you you there you were referencing things like like redlining. He he referenced in the video if you, if you could follow it. Um, uh, some of these instances of indisputable racism in the law, but that's inconvenient for simple-minded fragile white people like Matt Gates to engage with. And he is there to protect people who are even more fragile who voted for him. Um, so he can like make a little face about it, but it's true. Um, Dan also referenced uh, the case of Vanessa Guillen, which we did talk about actually several times. But um, yes, um, yeah, it's there, it's there and it's real. And uh, to, to really briefly sum up the video for those of you who might not have been able to follow it. He was saying, we need to understand our history. Okay, it's the same argument that most non generals have been making that aren't insane, which is we need to know this stuff. So he said he reads things like he said he reads Karl Marx, he reads Mao, he reads, I think he said Ayn Rand. Did he say Ayn Rand? There might have been a reference to Rowling in there. I don't know, but he reads widely so that he understands the world and can then crush it as part of the American empire. That's what you need to do. And Matt Gates, of course, doesn't stand for any sort of historical understanding. He stands for protecting the feelings of racists and also trying to flood the zone with absolute nonsense so that he never has to put forward a single idea that would help relieve even one ounce of the economic suffering of the American working class. I mean, that's the basic thing right there. Anyway, um, apologies for the, video, the issues with the video. So uh, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take our first break a little bit early. There are other videos coming up. We're gonna see if we can get that to be a bit smoother. Uh, but for now, let's see what's going on in the audience as we take this break. Okay, everybody. What's going on? You're going on. Um, we wanted to get to a few of your comments. We had Exoteric Dragon saying, hey, John, I was in the USMC during 9-11. War is what turned me progressive. Wasn't until I found TYT that I could put a label on my ethics. Wow, yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it helped me way back in the day. Um, TYT on Air America 
as well as a little bit of Sam Cedar actually back in the day. A bunch of those shows um, helped me. Uh, Lawrence Wells says, uh, I didn't grow up in the right part of the world. Oh, I think this is one's from yesterday. Lawrence Wells had said, I didn't grow up in the right part of the world to see Wayne's World when it came out. I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. Well, it seems like you have possibly seen it since then. Um, and thank you to all of you who helped us. Uh, I'm still here, <laughs> what's up? Um, so what's going on basically is there are some gremlins in the machines. We're gonna see if we can get rid of those. <laughs> okay, um, and I'm not sure if anyone is actually stocking the dock right now. So we're gonna see about that, but I did wanna thank as I'm reloading this, tech is working out so well today. Thank you everyone for bearing with us. It wouldn't be TYT if anything ever worked. Uh, Magid bin Mahfouz uh, became a TYT executive producer over like in the actual uh, members. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Mama Misa says, uh, has anyone tried turning it off and back on? I am assuming that is definitely a part of it. Mini Morpho says that's what you get for leaving the pastries out. Yes, most people don't know gremlins attracted to pastries and advanced expensive technology. Can I just say this is Eight. the importance of infrastructure week? <laughs> exactly, we're just trying to demonstrate it. We're just trying to demonstrate it. You know, briefly, I, I wanna I wanna just um, get your thoughts on something that we talked about in the pre-show. Uh, it is, um, so you know, they've, they've been talking about sort of a, a dual path to this. Okay, so you get the crappy version, we'll pass that bipartisan, but don't even worry, cuz then via reconciliation, we'll do all the good stuff. Well, Nancy Pelosi says, we're not gonna vote on the, the bipartisan one until we get the reconciliation one. Do you trust that? Absolutely not, and only because I've been paying attention to politics for, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take out 90% of the time I've been paying attention to politics and just say a year. Because I've been looking <laughs> That's for all like it takes. a year. That's all it takes. It takes six months to understand this. Um, we saw Nancy Pelosi offer like essentially a worse st um, stimulus deal, I remember, than Trump did at a certain point because she thought it played yep. into some like election calculus. I this is why I'm increasingly on the case of I need the squad to get annoying. I need the squad to like kind of say we're not going to vote until we get some of these priorities so they can be just as like annoying yeah. as Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema. If they vote That's together true. as a block, which is kind of what we wanted them to be in there to do, this can ultimately get a little bit better because otherwise it's gonna be pretty grim and watered down from here. That's true. There's there's been a little bit of that in infrastructure. Um and I know like for instance Bernie has made has implied some of the lines he won't cross. The issue is, at least for right now, it seems like somehow they've been able to get, I guess they're so scared of an actual infrastructure bill that they've been able to get enough Republicans that potentially they could override even the very few Senate progressives if they were to um, stick together. Anyway, uh, Eric the Red in the member section is saying TYT is having trouble with a close up of a gremlin face from the movie Gremlins. Have they already made that yet? That's definitely coming. Uh, Katie Jack says, I can't take my eyes off Dan's background. What is that gray lump? Oh yeah, that's what people were talking about. People are like, there's a body in Dan's background. It does look like a body. What is that? Uh, that is my pillow. I am just moving into my undisclosed new location and it is just very. Are we back? I, I assume we're back for actual news. No? Seems like it. I don't see a ticker. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Sorry, it's the, a lot of stuff behind the scenes. Is should I go into the? I need, I need, a, I need to know if we're still in the break or not. Go with the news. Yeah, go with the news. That, that's a go. Okay, thank All you. Right. Apologies, it's a complex machine with many moving parts that I only dimly at best understand. So thank you to everybody behind the scenes that's trying to make everything work. That said, we do have other news. So let's get into that that second video from the B block, and we'll we'll roll the dice and see how it goes. <clears throat> Critical race theory is one of the best areas of grift right now, which is why I wanted to make sure that I gave Dan a chance to talk about it once again. What can't it do? That's the question we've been asking. What can't you blame on critical race theory? Well, Dick Morris is a true grifter. He's coming up with some pretty wild ideas. Let's let's give it a try. This, this poison, poison for critical, critical, critical race, race theory, theory. Yeah. This cancer. is cancer. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's affecting all, all of our institutions, institutions schools, schools universities, universities, the military, the military uh, all, all over. And it's, and it's based on the fundamental, fundamental proposition that all white, white people are racist, are racist. whether they are inherently, inherently that or not. Their background makes them racist. Right. 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 Original sin, right. really. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, uh, and that all white people got what they got by exploiting blacks. 
I have a unique, I have a unique thought, thought about that, though. What does, what this, does this do to children? To children? What, is what does this do to a kid? A quarter, a quarter of, of all black, black marriages are intermarriages racially. racially. Wow, wow. So what does, so what does that, that do to a black, black boy, boy black and white kid? whose yeah. mother is a white, a white and his father is mother mother black and his father is white? What does he think? My father exploited my mother and that's how he got successful. And if a couple breaks up, does this have to choose one over the other? Does it, does it reinforce, reinforce the edible notion all kids have wanting, wanting to kill their father, father and marry their mother? Their mother? <laughs> uh, I mean, what does this, this do to the children? children? Okay, everybody. Well, you enjoyed Big News Wednesday. Welcome to Tech Apocalypse Thursday. Anyway, I'll I'll sum it up for you. It's pretty simple, actually. What does it do to the children if you tell them that he's the worst and that he'll hate his father and want to sleep with his mother? No, literally, he said this could lead to kids wanting to kill their father and sleep with their mother. Which just reeks to me like a guy that's been looking for an excuse for a while and he thinks maybe he's found something he can point to. Dan, I, a lot of the commentary about critical race theory has been quite disconnected from anything having to do with not just critical race theory, but any sane conversation about racism. Um, I, I don't, is this the worst? I don't know. I mean, like they were saying yesterday on Newsmax that it would lead to the, like to the, the concentration camps, but. Um, I think sleeping with your mom is 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 pretty weird too. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I, I don't remember Oedipus being mixed, but like that's a whole separate like different that's thing. That's true. I I mean Newsmax is like the nectar of ignorance, so like you have to sort of like watch it with that sort of like viewpoint there. But the that's really the only way you can watch that clip is to view it through the idea of ignorance, because it's like okay, let's take the logic through as he's saying it. Is it, it's ridiculous to me. Is it actually the case, truly, where if you have a kid who is learning what critical race theory is in schools, which is not that, it's not that all white people are inherently racist, it's just that the society that we live in was built with laws that were inherently racist. And also, by the way, because we also don't know things, even well intentioned people can sometimes mess up here and there. And there's a difference in like, Different gradations of racism, of course, but like there's also gradations of sexism that like you and I as men, John, will like always accidentally maybe step into, even though we're trying very hard not to consciously, right? So like it's sort of an understanding about that that um, like other people have said, like there's a top general recently who spoke on this that just being able to understand other people and understand the plights of other people should mm -hmm. in the grand like idealistic way of things make you a better citizen, a better quote unquote American, even though it's arguable that being an American has ever been synonymous with like accepting your neighbors. I think there's a famous quote where like every 50 years or so like America forgets like the previous like generation of immigrants, they assimilate now there's a mm -hmm. new generation of immigrants to hate. So like um, it, it's just all kind of nonsense. It only makes sense if you're like, well, yeah, well, what if the dad is white and the mom is black? Won't the kid think he's a slave? Like, it's just like, yeah, I, where do you go to think that? Well, here's the issue. Where you went was to attempt to start a nuanced conversation about all of this and about the um, inability of even the person with the best intentions to occasionally transgress. Um, you seem supportive of an environment in which that's not necessarily cause for being completely wiped out as they would imply that you might be. He's not interested in that. And the thing is, this is the issue fundamentally with the debate bros and with the change my mind thing on the right. They know that actually engaging in any way with that nuanced conversation is a losing battle. Because the goal of a nuanced conversation like that is understanding, evolution, and progress. They're not interested in that, they're interested in distraction, which is why they're not debating anything within a country mile of critical race theory or that they don't understand that. Even just like what should a discussion about race be in school? They're not engaging in that conversation. That's why they're coming up with nonsense to argue like the teacher comes in and says, Johnny, you suck, your dad's the worst. That's not what's happening, which means that we can't really argue against it because we're not talking about the same thing. Dan and I are talking about reality and they're talking about a fantasy where they tell kids to want to sleep with their mom and that it's going to lead to the Holocaust and that critical race theory has led to a woke military that's going to give rise to Hitler. 
These are not, this is not a discussion or a debate because they don't want it to be. That's the issue. And that's why sometimes I play videos like this. I'm not super interested in Dick Morris. Few people are, including his close family. But I am interested in the consequences it's gonna have for our nation. And so the last question I would ask you, Dan, is it is fairly clear that the right thinks we gotta have something for 2022. We're definitely not gonna come up with like a healthcare plan or something. So this is it. If it, if it's not gonna be just attacking trans youth, if it's not gonna be the the you know the Dr. Seuss because that didn't last. This is gonna be it. So my question to you is, how likely is this to actually work? To fire them up for the next 15 months or so, in in place of some sort of actual economic plan that this is their strategy. Well, to begin to get into your question, John, I just had to point out my other favorite part in that video, which was in the first five seconds, the guy goes, well, you know, obviously 25% of black marriages are interracial now. And it's like, you do realize interracial marriages at one point were illegal, right? And so now you're talking about critical race theory not existing, this idea that- That's structural there were racism. Oh no, it's, it's like- <laughs> It was I, I, literally I illegal, but they say that there was no systemic racism. You couldn't like, do it. And so to get into your question, John, this critical race theory stuff is very flimsy for you and I. I think it's very flimsy for like the professional middle class of like liberals and Democrats who um, were really down with the Black Lives Matter thing and like may not really be showing up as much like anymore, but like still kind of felt some educational angle to that. This isn't gonna work to them. All this is is red meat for a base who, yeah, like you were alluding to, John, will get energized by this kind of stuff. I just don't think that the Republican Party will be gaining any more you know, people in their base. If anything, they'll just be muddying the waters because you'll have, of course, this perpetual both sidesing that happens in this country where one side proposes something that's just like standard factual existence. And the other party just proposes something against that just for the sake of having a counter argument. Um, so that's just kind of how it goes. I don't think it's going to help them gain any support, but it's definitely gonna be red meat for their base. And like racism has taken, like using racism as a political tool has taken racism as like a broad political movement throughout history to this very day, undefeated. So it'll continue to work, unfortunately. Okay, well, um, in terms of the electoral consequences, I hope that you're right, we'll see. Uh, regrettably, whether you're right or not along the way, it is going to turn at least some people off from being open to the nuanced conversation you were talking about to actually learning about any of this and improving as a people and as a society. Now that said, let's turn to something very different. <clears throat> Every once in a while, the IPCC puts out comprehensive reports on the state of the climate, what's going on with climate change. And there is one coming up for later this year, and it's expected that it's going to be a big one. Well, thankfully, we don't have to wait. Some leaks have already come out. And I think you can probably guess where this is going. Uh, on Thursday, we got an idea of some of the content. The draft warns of a series of thresholds beyond which recovery from climate breakdown may become impossible. It warns, quote, life on Earth can recover from a drastic climate shift by evolving into new species and creating new ecosystems. Humans cannot. Which seems fairly definitive, but they have more. The report warns of progressively serious centuries long and in some cases irreversible consequences. The report also said that the millions of people who live along coastlines almost everywhere around the world could be battered by multiple climate calamities at once. Drought, heat waves, cyclones, wildfires, and flooding, which sounds bad. But don't worry, as Ben Shapiro said, just sell your coastline property. Anyway, some of their other findings, including predicting that up to 80 million more people than today will be at risk of hunger just by 2050. 350 million more people living in urban areas will be exposed to water scarcity from severe droughts. That's at just 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. If we get to two degrees, it'll be 410 million people at risk of severe drought and water scarcity. And that extra half a degree will also mean 420 million more people exposed to extreme and potentially lethal heat waves. And I always like synergy in the news. I think it was great that they synced up this leak with the crazy heat wave that is already going across the, the, the world. I mean, we're getting it bad in a number of different areas in the US. Yesterday, we talked about the fact that the Arctic land temperature was 118 degrees. This is absolute madness, Dan. And I'm sure it'll get through to people and together 
we will face this crisis and persevere. <laughs> now, John, as long as you and I keep doing our individual part to reduce, reuse, and recycle, the climate will get better. <laughs> and and thanks, yeah. we just need to continue watching those ads of um, soap companies cleaning off oil from birds and then <laughs> There's that's their accountability. We recycle, or they birds. make the ads about cleaning birds, and then it's all good. No, um, it's these even in like sort of my young life, like going through these things where like I sort of started out with like an inconvenient truth, not like starting yeah. out like watching it when I was in kindergarten, but like that came out when I was very very young, and that was like a dire thing. Some things came true from that, some things didn't, but generally the trend is every year the predictions get worse and then every year the records get beaten for heat records like i forget how often it's like this season's the biggest hurricane uh season on record and the previous ones on records were all in the past 10 years like it's you hear that with hurricanes and droughts and it's happening so much it's happening for people who um unfortunately to ben shapiro because it doesn't fit into his lazy ass arguments yeah. they live in remote areas of the world that are for reasons that Ben Shapiro doesn't want to explain, have been heavily hit economically already. And so they can't just sell their house. First off, the idea of selling property that's about to be destroyed, who is going to give you enough money for that to get you to move? And second of all, this isn't yeah. like a, oh, I'm just gonna be on this like remote kind of coastal island here where we make the equivalent of like $3 a day doing like farming or something like that. Oh, I'm just going to go to the local real estate agent and put a little for sale sign in front of my beachfront property. Property that I have, and there's move yeah. like it's a fantasy world, but unfortunately, the fantasy world that is politically um, advantageous to Ben Shapiro, of uh, editor emeritus of the Daily Wire, which was founded by Dan and Ferris Wilkes, who made all their money off of fracking. So maybe that has a case in what he has to say about it. But maybe. this has been politically advantageous and economically advantageous for the right wing and the industries they protect to gaslight about climate change for the past 20 years. Yeah. In 2015, I would have ended that sentence by saying, and it's time for them to stop. It's too late. It's 2021. It's already over for that. Like, it, we're heading for some really bad stuff. Now we need to mitigate at least how bad it could be. We can't reverse it. We just got to mitigate. That's how bad it is listening to them. And so, again, for those who are inclined, we need to stop doing the same thing, expecting a different result. We need more kind of climate action and justice. And like, I'm glad for you, John, for putting these stories in the forefront and uh, hopefully getting us there. Well, thank you. And yes, you're right to point out, um, seeing something like this should not lead you to be like, oh well, it's done. Uh, it's not either climate change or not climate change. It is of course uh, a gradient as uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez pointed out on her Instagram yesterday. Uh, so we can make it better or we can not. We can make it worse if we don't do anything. We've been doing that for a long time. Maybe we should do something different. Um, and I too agree. Uh, I remember uh, an inconvenient truth coming out. I was so young when that came out, just as young as you when that came out. Sure. Anyway, uh, let's talk a little bit more about this. So, um, no, it's funny. Anyway, uh, one of the things about the leak of this IPCC report that's so important is that for the first time, it's going to be focusing on what are called tipping points, which we we got into a little bit yesterday on the show, but I want to talk about it more. They had been previously criticized for failing to take account of tipping points. They basically talked about it as a linear process, which it very much is not the heating of, of the earth. So for instance, and some of these I apologize, we did talk about yesterday, but I wanna go more in depth. As rising temperatures lead to the melting of Arctic permafrost, the unfreezing soil releases methane, a powerful greenhouse gas that in turn causes more heating. It also, as we talked about, releases viruses and things like that, and just carbon, but also methane. So that is a tipping point. Once, if it's frozen or if it's not frozen, when it's not frozen, it releases something that makes it actually worse. Other tipping points include the melting of polar ice sheets, which once underway may be almost impossible to reverse, even if carbon emissions are rapidly reduced, and which would raise sea levels catastrophically over many decades. Another is the possibility of the Amazon rainforest switching suddenly to savanna, which scientists have said could come quickly. And with relatively small temperature rises, that would be an absolute disaster, not just because you're literally turning a rainforest into savanna. But also, as of right now, at least, to the extent that it still does, the rainforest and places like it would act as carbon sinks. They would take in carbon and carbon and they would hold it there. But at some point, they too will begin to release that carbon back into the atmosphere. That is, again, another tipping point. Once we get past that, then it's actually making it even worse. 
And so the fact that they're finally talking about this is good. I want people to have an understanding of how these tipping points actually work. I hope that it will lead to a little bit more you know, understanding the general populace that won't just lead to, as Dan pointed out, well, I should take straws more seriously. Yes, you should, but that's not gonna solve it. Pressure on politicians to do the right thing. Now, I'm gonna risk this. Let's see if we can listen to a little bit of Greta Thunberg responding to some of what came out in these leaks of the upcoming IPCC report. It confirms what we already knew, that the situation is very dire and that we need to act right now. But at least I find it's very hopeful that it seems that many people are becoming more and more ready to tell it like it is. And we can, of course, not face this crisis unless we tell it like it is, unless we are adult enough to tell the truth and to, to face the reality. So I find this, uh, this could be something that could lead to something that could wake people up, which is very hopeful, I think. It's hopeful, maybe unrealistically so. I don't know, Dan, you're, you're a realist, what do you think? Cynical media is going to cover it. Yeah, yeah, like it's it's going to be like a Guardian article or two, and then like it's going to like unfortunately move on, sadly. But like, I'm not going to analyze Greta Thunberg the same way I would analyze like a politician doing damage sure. control, because I would otherwise say that like there are a lot of qualifications in there, like could could possibly, which I think is like implicit understanding that like hey, listen, at this momentum right now, there still needs to be like a lot more to be done. I mean, this is Greta Thunberg, the top like climate activist who has made like she has become like the face of the movement now, and that's been really good because she can express like this um, truly like brutal honesty. While also being relatively like, you know, like she can be honest, but she can also represent hope in the future, right? And so ideally, we can do something like that, but it's going to involve more than just like a news article. It's gonna say, okay, you have this news article, now what do you do with it? Now what politicians are going to take this information and use it and use their power to pressure those corporations and then use our people power to provide people power to that pressure and make it a PR nightmare for those corporations and shame them into change. Cuz I think it's possible on the corporate level, not the political level to shame people still. Yeah, I think that we've seen some evidence of that. Okay, uh, we are gonna take a break. When we come back though, we've got some breaking news, which is just gonna fill Dan and I with as much hope as I just saw in Greta's young face about the prospects of this IPCC report, as well as other news after this. Okay, everyone, let's see what's going on out there. In the member section, Eclectic Miscellaneous says, uh, forget Lenin, the way things are going, Lenin's going to be too left now for the US. That's pretty funny. Um, Shikata Ganai says, Nancy's statement will echo throughout history, LOL. Yeah, I don't think it wasn't even really delivered like she had any hope of that. But we're gonna have a little bit more from Nancy Pelosi after this, so get ready for that. Glamour Dragon says, it is my birthday tomorrow, so I won't be getting to watch live, but excited for today's show, happy pre-birthday to you. Oh, Heads up to the team, so I am gonna do that breaking news when we come back. So, you know, let's, I don't know. I don't know what we're gonna have in terms of lower third or whatever, but but that's gonna be coming. Uh, JNL says, okay, Dan, I gotta ask what's, oh, more people are asking about the thing behind your, behind your uh, head on the bed. It also looks like there's a laptop potentially. Yeah, I so I'm I very excited you. about your background. I swear to you, and I'm gonna have a better background soon. Um, I just wanted to, and a better mic. You'll you'll love that for the audio quality, folks out there. But this is a bed. It's a stuffed animal I have behind me. Um, I have my laptop with my little Dan from the Internet sticker, all branded nicely and placed relatively nicely, even though the lower third has been blocking it the whole show. <laughs> and then you have my clock in the background with the same thing, which the lower third hasn't been blocking. So there's the branding. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I will have I'll have better decorations uh, soon. This is like a whole streaming setup for me. So. I like Watch the color this space. Theme. Looks good. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, Cough uh, Chick says the echo is actually triggering a migraine. Whew. Okay. Well, it seems like they fixed it. It's been fixed. The last video was super smooth. Thank you to everybody behind the scenes who got that worked out so quickly. Um, so hopefully that'll help. 
Uh, Nicole Smith, welcome to tier three YouTube membership. Look forward to speaking with you hopefully during the live Q and A, which is coming up in not that much longer. Uh, Shagaduche says, uh, culturally sensitive remedies to educational problems of oppressed minority students that ignore the political aspect of schooling are doomed to failure. Well, the thing is like at this point, it's a, it's like a reaction to something that's not even there. Like, so yeah, well, we'll see. Uh, Luis Belmont show walkthrough says no, even the Belmont Sentinel Dragon isn't that ruthless with his B roll. Also, Matt Gates is a giant tool. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah, and he demonstrated it in that video. Franklin Sharpslicer says we ought to do a skit series teaching non CRT theories. Columbus discovered America, Washington chopped a tree. Jesus is white, don't flee, don't flee. It wasn't right unless it's white. What a series to see. I think you could probably get that played in a lot of schools. Uh, especially in some parts of the country. Uh, Mary Hooker Meyer says, you have to watch after the warming, which was made in 1989. We were told what is going to happen well before inconvenient truth. Sad thing is corporations don't care and politicians are beholden to them, won't do anything. Unfortunately, that is the status quo. We are trying to fight back against it, but Mary Hooker Myers, thank you very much for that if, super chat. If I could really quickly tease John, uh, my next video, which you don't know anything about yet, but I may have you cameo in if you are so inclined, has to do with like okay. the intersection of climate um, policy and like what people can do on an individual level versus like what we expect corporations and people with lots of money, power, and influence to be able to do. So oh, that'll be that's, interesting. That's a good idea. Good topic, I like it. Okay, over in Twitch, uh, let's see, Dejati gifted a tier one sub. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Dissa Darling, I think I probably mispronounced that, but thank you. Subscribe for the third month. It says hi from West Coast Canada. You guys are awesome. P.S. The name is Dichi Darling. Whoa, TDR. Dichi Darling, thank you. I will forget that for the next time, but thank you very much for now. Uh, okay, only a few seconds left. Okay, well, we will, we will get to more. After this next section, but we got some important news to get to. So uh, let's get ready for that. And uh, yes, looks like everything is working pretty smoothly. More after this. Okay, let's jump into this. A bit of breaking news for you that should send a shiver running down your spine. Joe Biden has announced a bipartisan infrastructure plan. <laughs> Okay, they have a deal. Five Democrats, five Republicans, $953 billion, really? That's all? He proposed $2.3 trillion. They proposed like $700 billion. So they went up $200. He went down $1.4 trillion. Now there's more to it. I would start off by saying, okay, maybe I'm an idiot. But if the issue is that they're going to filibuster it and you've got five Republicans signed on, are you sure you have the other five you need? I'm assuming they're there, Dan, but I haven't actually seen the list of names. So are you 100% sure that we wouldn't go through all this rigmarole and then the Republicans would just filibuster it anyway? Dan, thoughts? I don't know, John, it's not like that's happened before at all ever over the past 10, maybe 20 years or longer since at least the Gingrich years. But like, uh, who am I? Not someone who's been paying attention to politics for a long time. <laughs> and understand that Democrats are stuck on one continuous loop. I mean, yeah, the, the original, I mean, we're, we're talking about this right now. The news is literally just breaking and the deals are really, uh, the details are really scant. But one they thing are. that stuck out to me was, um, Senator Suzanne Collins, Susan Collins from Maine saying, quote, we're still refining the details, but from my perspective, it's paid for. Because the key issue was Biden wanting to use a lot of um, taxation and raising taxes on people making over a certain amount of money to fund the bill. And of course, Republicans are like hard no on taxes. So the fact yeah. that they've come to an agreement, it probably is a result of, oh, they probably don't want to have to raise taxes that much because the amount of the bill didn't go up that much. But it's already being messaged by a Democratic like, People in the know through the media can already kind of tell us that oh, this is just you know dip number one. This is just the appetizer for um, infrastructure because they're going to get the next big infrastructure bill through budget reconciliation, and so hopefully that'll like stymie the progressives off here or there. Um, we'll color see. me skeptical. Color me skeptical. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll take the same color actually. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to get details. 
So let's see, many details have yet to be laid out how it's actually gonna be funded. It's expected it'll be paid for with revenue increases that don't violate Mr. Biden's pledge not to raise taxes on the middle class or Republicans red line of not reversing business tax cuts passed under Donald Trump, which sounds to me just like no new taxes. So is it gonna be the gas tax? Is it gonna be new fees on EVs? Bernie Sanders said he wouldn't vote for that. Although maybe they have enough Republicans who are willing to sign on to this quasi infrastructure bill that Bernie would be rendered irrelevant. But um, I will fill in some of the gaps that you probably are already suspecting. A $953 billion infrastructure bill of which I can't even tell you at this point how much of that is new spending. Cuz it's not $953 billion worth of new spending. Isn't going to include anything to combat climate change, investments in childcare, education, other social programming. The, the, the broader definition of human infrastructure that had been in the original bill, it's not in there. So I, maybe there's some bridges, we'll see. I don't know how much. Now, Nancy Pelosi says, uh, there ain't no infrastructure bill without the reconciliation bill. She said those literal words, and that is supposedly where we're gonna get more of this. Although in theory, if the Republicans are opposed to that being there, wouldn't they oppose a bipartisan bill that would then open the door for a reconciliation bill that included it? I feel like they'd be able to see past that little switchy switch. Um, but anyway, yeah, as Dan said, at this point, we don't have a lot of details. It looks fairly lame. A lot of it is going to come down to what ends up being in the reconciliation bill. Although I can't even guarantee that it's gonna happen. God only knows what the Senate par- parliamentarian is gonna say when we finally get to that stage, Dan. Yeah, just to, I have two more points to update you on something you said, John. According to at least the article we have right now, there's $559 billion in new spending. So okay, thank ag- you. against half, like half a trillion, that's not really enough to really get going, honestly, for all the infrastructure that's needed. Remember, our last major infrastructure bill was like the interstate highway system, let's say, maybe 50s or 70s. And since then, <laughs> we've just sort of been like kicking the can down the road until the can runs into the bridge and the bridge collapses. But um, yeah. yeah, I'm gonna trust Joe Biden. The We'll get you the $2,000 checks. Oh no, we, it was always gonna be 1400 checks guy. I'm gonna trust him with the numbers and get us like really yeah. where we wanna go. Absolutely, I'm sorry I was not born yesterday. Well, we'll see, we'll be tracking it and you'll be tracking it with us. So we'll see what happens. Okay, with that said, let's get into our last story for this first linear hour of the show. Here's a fun one, great news for you. I, maybe we'll have some good news or at least fun news later, don't worry. <clears throat> the Supreme Court came out with another decision. This one bad for unions, bad immediately for unions, even worse because of the implication to quote a character from Always Sunny in Philadelphia. They ruled on Wednesday that a California regulation allowing union organizers to recruit agricultural workers at their workplaces violated the constitutional rights of their employers. So let's give you a little more details. It involves a nearly half century old California regulation, which give union organizers limited temporary access to farm work sites. So they can't just be there all the time. They have a limited amount of time that looks like this. A union may enter such a work site for up to 30 days at a time, and it may invoke this right up to four times a year. When they're there, they get up to three hours a day to speak to workers, potentially the hour before the start of work, the hour after the end of work, and the workers lunch break. So literally none of this is actually infringing on the actual time where people are working. Um, Union organizers are thus allowed on a farm's property for a maximum of 120 days a year, three hours per day. And the union has to tell the employer when they wanna use this right. So that's how it's worked for half century, but apparently no longer. It was a 6-3 vote along ideological lines, and why not? Donald Trump got elected. So they got their conservative Supreme Court, which is why you get cases like this. They ruled that the law unconstitutionally appropriates private land by allowing organizers to go on farm property to drum up union support. Chief Justice John Roberts said the access regulation grants labor organizations a right to invade the grower's property. That meant he wrote that it was a taking of private property without just compensation. So. Uh, Do the union owners literally bag it up and run out with it? Is it theirs now? No, but it's a taking. And that's really where the true horror of this in the future starts, which we'll get into. But I wanna give uh, Dan a chance to talk about this, this most recent um, ruling. Dan, I'm not hearing you. My bad, sorry, I was muted because there was stuff around me. But I think the worst 
thing that stood out to me from this article was, I mean, like from the story was that consideration, the legal framing right there that these um, unions are going on to farm workers property without compensation. Because I think there was some like legal like analysis of this that went along the lines of, well, there could be some middle ground where the uh, unions compensate the farm workers for being on their property for that time. But then it goes into what is that compensation? I think in that legal example that I'm remembering the quote from, it was like, oh, could be as little as $50. Sure. I mean, I think the idea of like a $50 union tax is a form of union busting in that way from the judicial level, sure, but let's take that for granted. Do you think it's really gonna be $50? Or do you think that they're going to take that definition that's already very, like, and purposely broad to say, no, we're going to calculate how much money we are claiming that the union would cost the company in profits or whatever. And we're gonna charge you that much to try to do it as another mm-hmm. way of actually deterring people. So I think this is, as a lot of people are saying, a um, harbinger for having a uh, conservative Supreme Court that is just unabashedly, unapologetically trying to get through policy agenda items that uh, the Congress, congressional Republicans and the legislative branch don't have the ability to do yet. Yeah, yeah, it, it's gonna be pro-corporate so that the Republicans don't have to actually try to pass bills to accomplish the same things. Activist judges, which they say they don't want. So uh, why is this so bad? It's not just this California regulation. Let's let's give you a little idea from um, Nico uh, Bowie had a thread about this on Twitter saying, the Supreme Court just declared that when a law temporarily limits a property owner's right to exclude, the government takes the owner's property and must pay them. Um, goes on to say anti-discrimination laws take employers right to exclude workers of color, pregnant workers and LGBTQ plus workers. Anti-retaliation laws take employers right to exclude whistleblowers and workers who complain of harassment. It is not difficult to describe any law as taking something. The conservative deregulationists on the Supreme Court just said the government must pay for what it regulates. And so that is that is truly the potential issue here. It's not just this regulation, it's not just unions coming, although effectively allowing a corporation to decide how much they might need to be compensated when they have no interest in the union workers even being there. Thus the regulation in the first place is scary enough by itself. But now if taking something can literally be defined as not taking something, if that's what you need it to, to destroy some sort of government regulation, then I have no clue. I don't think anyone yet knows how broad that could go over the next few years with this Supreme Court. If they buy the nonsense in this ruling, I don't know what the limit of that is or if indeed there is any limit. Let's find out together how bold they're gonna be. That's gonna be fun. Just this is another reminder, the Supreme Court is incredibly important. Control of it is incredibly important. That is a huge consequence of who becomes president. Just bear that in mind going forward. Final thought. You have like 20 McConnell, seconds. McConnell already said he would block a Supreme Court justice pick in 2024, 2023. So like, just so you know the game Republicans are playing, that's how serious it is. Yeah, yeah. And Stephen Breyer, it's so fun to just wait. It adds a little bit of like tension, you know? Why not have this be a 7-2 or an 8-1? Make it a game <sighs> show, call it like LeBron's The Decision. Exactly. Um, Okay, well, we've got a lot more news to get to, but we're unfortunately running low in time in this first uh, linear hour. So to our linear audience, thank you so much for watching. For those of you watching on the members app or on Twitch or on YouTube, uh, please stick with us because we got a lot more to get to, including a little bit more when it comes to, to unionization. And then eventually, Tucker Carlson is very concerned about the chocolate content of Hunter Biden's briefs. We've got that for you after this.
for so minutes, maybe close to 30 uh, with Dan. Uh, before we jump back into the news, and there's a lot to get to, I did wanna let you know about a few things. Um, I am giving you this update under duress, but you're supposed to know that someone named Emma Vigeland of the Majority Report is gonna be with Anna Kasparian on the Young Turks today. I'm sure that'll be fun doing the news with Emma, that'll be great. I remember what that was like. Anyway, you can tune in at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Pacific Time for what'll probably be a great show. Anyway, well, thanks uh, for the invite. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, also, coming up after this show, you don't even have to wait that long. Indisputable with Dr. Rashad Ritchie is going to be streaming at youtube.com slash indisputable tyt. You know who you got? You got Andy Hale, guest today, a documentary, uh, Murder in the Park, about wrongful convictions and the death penalty. That should be fascinating. Trey Raydell, a conservative, is going to be on. Sounds like a good debate. And Wazni Lambre is going to be the co host. Uh, Indisputable has been taking off. It's a great show, it's a fun show. Their daily uh, checking in with the Karens across America is so much fun. So definitely stay tuned after uh, this show. I also wanna let you know that we are in day four of member appreciation week at Shop TYT. You can get a free TYT tote bag with every order of $60 or more. Uh, that is today only. You can go to, uh, you have to add it to your order at Shop TYT and you can go to tyt.com slash notice to get a special promo code as well. So all that's available for you. Uh, definitely have fun with that. And uh, another reminder, the tier three member Q&A is coming up at noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time. So there is still time to uh, get a tier three membership or upgrade your membership and to take part in what's gonna be a fun little conversation. That said, Dan, you wanna jump back in on the news? Let's do it. Let's do it, okay. <clears throat> Some of the coal workers who've been striking since the beginning of April for better working conditions have taken their protest to Wall Street. I wanna give you a little bit of them outside of BlackRock doing their protest in New York. Okay, so they have been protesting now for a couple of months. Um, in Alabama, we've shown you some of the violence uh, that's been uh, deployed against the protesters. Uh, and they're not alone. It's not just uh, these uh, uh, striking uh, uh, coal workers. You also have, let's see, the president of the Retail Wholesale Department Store Workers Union and the Association of Flight Attendants are scheduled to, to join them. That has been going on. A spokesperson for the RWDSU said that uh, Stuart Applebaum, the leader of that first union, will take part as miners participated in demonstrations for the Amazon Union Drive in Bessemer earlier this year. Um, and, and one of the reasons I wanna keep coming back to this and especially stress that point is, I feel like because these striking workers are coal workers, some who might otherwise have an ideological inclination to push for better working conditions and unionization might be like, eh, it's coal or eh, they're probably conservatives. But the thing is they've shown solidarity with other striking workers already. Like that shouldn't be required for them to, to get our support, um, but they have. And as of right now, the industry hasn't budged. Uh, the coal company hasn't budged. Uh, a couple of weeks into the strike, it looked like there was a settlement. But the workers said that it wasn't sufficient and voted it down. Bear in mind, we've already covered what concessions they made back in 2016 to keep the company afloat. It was a fairly massive set of, 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 of like of lower wages, um, number of vacation days, things like that. And it's been almost half a decade now and the conditions haven't improved. So Dan, it's an interesting case because it's about coal. But what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, I think it's interesting, especially the way you framed this at how people might go, oh, this is coal or coal miners. I may not agree with them or not. When I think you can believe two things at once that um, A, Americans, especially regular rank and file people, not like us who are on media or pay attention to politics all the time as a hyper thing, often have multiple contradictory opinions about politics in their head at the same time. And that's just how they go. And so it's actually easier to build solidarity with people, especially when our enemies are the same. It's these large corporations who are being exploitative. We can actually build solidarity there. So I think it's yeah. really good that folks are supporting these coal miners in their strike and like what they're 
ultimately fighting for, which are just like the same things a lot of people want and fight for and aspire for, which are just better working conditions, the ability to be able to like provide for themselves, their loved ones. Like it's really general basic American stuff. A, a really savvy politician who wants to play off the whole, uh, or even a savvy right wing politician who wants to play off the whole like right wing populism thing could jump in and support these coal miners because that's gonna maybe be your base anyways. Mm -hmm. And then also on the flip side, a savvy left politician could really come in and go against that narrative that hey, people on the left of so called Democrats can't support like working class white folks or like working class just people of color in general, because yeah. it's not just white people who are coal miners. Um, so this is a, a good political opportunity to be here. And I'm excited for I'm hopeful for more of this type of attention to be paid on it and for more of these efforts to happen. Yeah, I, I loved your point about how a right wing populist could try to jump on this. Unfortunately, right wing populism is so substance free that they haven't done that with months in which to do it because there's nothing there. Um, yeah, and you know, and I, I made the point the last time we talked about this story that I wonder if like AOC or Bernie Sanders have reached out. I don't know, honestly, maybe they have. I don't know, but I would love to see one of those politicians showing them that support. But uh, but I want to piggyback on Dan's point about the right wing politicians because I saw an article on Gizmodo that was very fascinating that brought up something something that makes sense. This is by Darna Noor of Gizmodo who who said, "Why is it that Fox News has no interest in this whatsoever? Like Fox apparently, according to Darna Noor, has not talked about this. It's a protest that's been going on for almost three whole months. It is literal coal miners fighting back against this exploitative company." And the thing is, they love coal miners most of the time. She describes it, here was a scene made for TV. Burly miners that so often form the backdrop for former President Donald Trump's environmental rollback announcements, standing up to rapacious firms that populist Republicans have railed against. You know, It's part of the ruling class that Tucker Carlson loves to talk about. Um, and they would talk about how Biden was talking about shutting down coal plants. Uh, he's shutting down pipelines. These damn Dems are fighting back against these workers who are the lifeblood of America. Oh, those workers that are lifeblood of America want better working conditions? Screw them. We're not even going to acknowledge that they exist. And isn't that kind of weird? Like they would have you believe that the right wing populace, you know? Like screw that socialist populism. That's stupid. We got a better version, it's a right wing version. But they have no interest in helping out these workers. They're not even willing to pretend because of course, they're not interested in coal workers. They're interested in coal executives, coal CEOs, coal company profits. Those are useful. The workers, those are inconvenient. They occasionally strike, they occasionally get black lung. We don't like it, it's, just, it's a bad look. And um, they're not even willing to pretend that it's anything more than that. Yeah, and they're not even Fox News is not really even willing to pretend they're a news network, even when it's easy for them. But no, I'm sure um, critical race theory and cancel culture and Hunter Biden and all those other different random things are much more relevant for these coal yeah. miners who are striking for their lives here. A hundred, yeah, a hundred percent. And you know, I, I don't know to what extent these coal miners are conservative or watch Fox News, but think about that. Think about the lack of interest they've shown in your plight. And that, it's why it's another great idea for someone like a Bernie Sanders to try to reach out to give them some support. Anyway, let's turn to very different news, sort of weird news. <clears throat> Yesterday it was announced that John McAfee, who's a controversial software magnate, he came up with the McAfee antivirus suite. Um, had apparently died in prison at 75. He was awaiting extradition in a Spanish prison after being charged with tax evasion in the United States last year. He was found dead in his cell in a prison near Barcelona Wednesday around 1 p.m. Eastern time. And there was a medical examiner uh, that went to the scene. So um, why are we talking about this? Well, because uh, this is 2021 and it's the internet and things are very weird. And so I want you to know what this case is because you're gonna see some weird stuff that's happening. Now, first of all, who is John McAfee? Why should you be concerned about him? Well, a friend of the show, Ken Klippenstein summed it up like this. Someone asked me who John McAfee is and I do not know how to answer that question. That's because it's very weird, like he made software and then he just sort of went very publicly wealthily crazy. And that's a thing now. Like. When CEOs are rich enough and crazy enough, 
We have to know who they are. You know, why do you know who the the owner of Tesla is? Because of social media, I guess. And he's an example of that. And the issue in this story is, he was found dead, so apparently of suicide. But some would have you believe that it was not suicide. And one of those people was him, because he tweeted a few years ago, getting subtle messages from U.S. officials saying, in effect, "We're coming for you, McAfee. We're going to kill yourself," which isn't grammatically correct. But I got a tattoo today, just in case. If I suicide myself, I didn't, I was whacked, check my right arm. And you can see the photo of his tattoo, which looks like swacked. But anyway, he had a tattoo saying he would never kill himself. And even in the last few days, members of his family were saying he would never kill himself. So now he turns up dead apparently of suicide. And so it's, it's the Epstein thing all over again, Dan. What do you make of it? I I remember like John McAfee. I've always pronounced it McAfee. Wow, well. um, but like it might be he, McAfee actually. But, but I don't see like a Mac. It's an MC Affy, so it's probably the McAfee. It's you know, um, I'm, I'm honestly want to respect this uh, dead man's life and his name and all that stuff. But no, I, I remember him kind of just having like a. I guess the modern equivalent would be like Dan Blazerian, just one of those people who would flex and have a lot of money on Instagram and take photos with women in bikinis and have that like whole deal and like make that like his whole life as like a playboy lifestyle kind of deal. Um, yeah, he was one of the early like even before sort of like Bill Gates speaking of this sort of circle mm -hmm. of people, just sort of like made a lot of money off of software, sold off of his company, and then lived the high life off of that. And it seemed like he was enjoying it. I mean, you, you know, you're living a crazy lifestyle when Vice does a documentary about you. So I think that's like floating around <laughs> somewhere. And that's true. Um, so I have, on the one hand, no reason to believe that he wanted to abandon that lifestyle unless he had to. And potentially face paying taxes because he really doesn't like paying taxes because he's one of those libertarian types. But even still, I don't think he would have wanted to abandon that lifestyle, even if it did mean a minor financial hit, because like none of these people ever do this. But I also, at the same token, and this is just like a random take, I don't find John McAfee, at least from what we know publicly right now, interesting enough of a person. Like he doesn't have any special information where like he needs to be killed or something. And if it was, mm -hmm. it probably wasn't like the US government or something, right? Like Epstein, it wasn't like the US government potentially allegedly killing Epstein. It's like someone he potentially worked with because he had dirt on them or something, right? But like John McAfee probably has dirt on people, but he doesn't seem like one of the powerful people. He seems like one of the people who would come up to one of those power brokers looking for some shady deals here or there, right? So yeah. I also don't find him interesting enough to have been assassinated, if that's something I can say. Yeah, but 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 some will want you to believe that he was. And this is let's let's jump into Griff Nation. Um this is a great grift. So people like uh, Ian Miles Chong, an online uh, grifter on Twitter, uh, tweeted John McAfee, and I believe everyone seems to be confirming it is McAfee. So thank you to all of you for doing that. Did not kill himself. He was swacked, and so he's selling T-shirts. He says he's going to use the proceeds to investigate the suicide. I I believe that Ian Miles Chong, from the reading I've read before, he's like big on the right now, uh, lives in the Philippines. I don't believe he's going to be investigating a Spanish prison. This is grift, tons of people are gonna be using this. And the issue is, look, is, is it possible that he believed that he was paranoid? He believed someone was hunting him down? Yes, it is possible. Um, not everybody who commits suicide was assassinated by the deep state though. And I believe that we are now on the cusp of that becoming the go-to, that the standard for everyone. And I am not saying that it's impossible. And I am not saying that there isn't violence in prisons, obviously. But I believe that evidence should be required at least with Epstein, he clearly had information about powerful people. So it's easy to sort of fill in the gaps. With McAfee, I have no idea what the reason is supposed to be, except that he had talked a lot in the past about how he would never suicide himself. And then when like his official social media, if we could jump ahead of this last graphic, literally just posts a cue on his social media, like just oh. an image, a big cue. This is just this is just what does that have to do with what does that have to do with Q? This is oh just God. trying to get into that conspiracy thing. 
That's the best part because all you do is I put it that. there. You don't say you don't say anything, and this is like a grift tactic. If you don't say anything about what you're putting out there, you let people put their own weird ideas onto it, and then that builds a sort of fact for these people in this fantasy land. Um, and it's a low blow, but like of course not surprising <laughs> that. Um, his death is being used by his official like members. Just continue some sort of grift um, like that. It's sick. Yeah, yeah. I, it's we live in a very weird time. And again, I don't have any secret information about this. I have no idea what happened, and I'm not ruling anything out. But I'm saying we can't just. Everybody just wants everything to be what they want it to be. And they immediately assume, well, no, it's clearly got to be the coolest thing that I thought of. Not necessarily. That's not always how life works. Anyway, that said, let's turn to something very different. <sighs> Is it time to free Britney? Well, she finally got her day in court talking about the conservatorship that she has been under for 13 years. And some of what she revealed was pretty crazy. So we're gonna give you a bit of this. She said, I've been in denial, I've been in shock, I am traumatized, I just want my life back. And so she gives an idea of what the conditions have been like that she's been living under. She recalled one incident in which she didn't want to do an additional run of shows in Las Vegas. She felt relieved when her handlers said she didn't have to do the shows anymore, but suspected that there would be consequences. Days later, she said her therapist told her that she, she that he had heard that she was being uncooperative. He then took her off her regular meds and put her on a lithium regimen. She said it was a strong drug. You can go mentally impaired if you stay in it longer than five months. I felt drunk. I couldn't even have a conversation with my mom or dad about anything. They had me with six different nurses. She talked about how she had to do an overwhelming number of therapy sessions. Um, she talks about how under the conservative tip ship, she's not able to get married or have a baby. She says, I have an IUD inside of myself right now, so I don't get pregnant. I wanted to take it out so I could have another baby, but this so-called team won't let me go to the doctor to take it out because they don't want me to have children, any more children. I need your help, she told the judge. I just don't want to be sat in a room for hours a day like they did to me before. They made it even worse for me. There's a lot more, perhaps we'll get into some of it. But Dan, she is describing obviously horrible conditions that she apparently up until very recently didn't even know that she could go to court to try to appeal this. Which seems to imply that her legal representation very clearly doesn't have her best interest at heart. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, you're absolutely right to go again there. Um, first of all, my thoughts are, yes, we got John to talk about a music story, hell yeah. Um, and then my <laughs> second thought is, yeah, with Britney Spears, the, there's there's levels to this, right? So not only are there the things that are happening to her, but like there was the controversy even surrounding the documentary that made a lot of people more recently aware of the, con, the situation with Britney Spears and her conservatorship, which um, Britney Spears actually responded to fairly recently saying that documentary herself was like really triggering and traumatizing because of a lot of the things that have happened to her underneath the situation. I mean, like it was real and brutal, but like it's, Oh, oh, like it's a lot going on there. And so what you have here is a woman who like through celebrity and fame is just like sort of being tormented through a lot of it. And you see this a lot even contemporarily in music where you have um, very young artists like their folks like Juice World and uh, Lil Peep who die because of drug overdoses, right? And their handlers are all around them in the studio while they're making all these songs about like drugs and all these other things. And they're very much like, well, he's continuing to make the songs and we're making money off of that. So we're not gonna stop him and his usage or anything like that. And then they overdose and die. And then people wonder, oh no, what has happened? How could this have possibly happen? There's a thing in the music industry where once there's a cash cow somewhere, the people around there are not interested in the well being of that person generally. It's the well being of how can you sustain this cash cow? How can you sustain this product? Yeah. For this business, right? And so it's very clear that Britney Spears was on the other end of that. And I think maybe you'll possibly get to this in a moment. The media at that time was very much not helpful in that either. Yeah, that that is that is totally true. I mean, she has been abused. This is one form of the abuse for 13 years, but like her entire life, obviously. And and I have no doubt that if she gets free of it. Tons of grifters will find some way to strip her of basically all the money that she has. They apparently, apparently have been quite successful with this because there are references. I talked to my producers about this this morning about her sixty million dollar fortune. How does Britney Spears have only a sixty million dollar fortune? She's been like a superstar for literally decades. Like somebody has the money that she made. 
But anyway, um, sorry, what was the what was the the aspect of this that you wanted to focus on? The aspect of the no, there was an aspect of this where the media was not really helpful. Oh, with sure, this sure, as well. sure. Yes. Well, and, and by the way, um, people have been pointing out the hypocrisy recently. Like, was it Perez Hilton who's like, yeah. yes, she finally gets her day in court. And it's like, dude, you, wait, what, did you forget everything that you've literally ever said about her and used your profile like to make people think about her? Like, you contributed to the media environment that her. Like the people who are trying to financially control her used to get that control. So, and he's hardly the only person. Obviously, there's more to it than that, which I'm sure, Dan, you can probably say a lot more about. Yeah, no, like Perez Hilton saying that is rich because you have this other media ecosystem that it's gotten in some ways better over the years. But obviously, like just like in politics, the most salacious stuff, the like drama filled things that gets the engagement and all the metrics that people who run these kind of businesses care about. And so they continued doing these stories. Perez Hilton back in the MySpace days was like the original grifter of celebrity gossip and drama. And so, and did a lot of it off of Britney Spears. Like Perez Hilton got his like capital as far as professionally and definitely got money off of like publicly like doing these just awful like newsstand gossip type articles about uh, about Britney Spears. And so mm -hmm. I think it's really rich for that to be coming out where he's continuing to say, oh, finally she gets her day in court without any sort of, it, it'd be fine if, she, if uh, Perez Hilton had previously done a statement saying, I regret a lot of the things I did and I'm going to change the way yeah. in which I do music reporting. But uh, he didn't do that. A lot of people who do music reporting is garbage. That's why I do the audio face podcast where we do music reporting in a really smart way that's fair and kind of just yeah. immoral sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, so well, we'll, I mean, we'll see if this changes the situation. There's been a lot of uh, media attention on it. Maybe that will do something. Um, and by the way, I say all this as like, I'm, I, Am I technically a fan of hers? I liked her early music. I have no vested interest. I just think like at some point, can can people just leave her alone? Like like seriously, like I understand that that's like a throwback or whatever, but like hasn't she been through enough at this point? And that's fully accepting that whatever comes next is probably gonna be its own unique hell. But maybe she could at least get a different hell after 13 years of this. Absolutely. Anyway, we only have a couple more minutes, so really fast. Do we have time? Oh, uh, we don't have time, no. Okay, well, look, the, the the chocolate in the underpants story, that is going to have to wait until tomorrow. But we're gonna have Francesca Fiorentini. I have a feeling she's gonna have some fun with it. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. So you've definitely got that. Uh, with the minute and a half that we have, I did wanna read a few super chats. We've been falling a bit behind on that. But um, Nicole Smith says, instead of trying to get 10 repubs to vote for it, abolish the filibuster, talking about the infrastructure bill, obviously that would be my preference. Um, John Campbell Reese says, a photo of Trump that regularly used on TYT has a bored looking General Miley. Obviously, he's a clever man, appalled at what his idiot uh, CNC is saying. Potentially, again, I don't know Miley's total past and everything. I'm not vouching for any general. Uh, Umberto says, I think that pillow is moving. Speaking about dance background, it totally looks like a body. It so looks like a body. I can anyway, neither confirm um, nor deny. Oh God, Wayne says uh, conservatives have now determined that critical race theory promotes a love of PB and J sandwiches, demanding their ban. Don't rule it out; it's a possibility. Uh, Tomas, thank you for your super chat. No message, but I appreciate it. And MJBM just became a tier three member, getting access to the live Q and A, which is coming up in like thirty-five minutes. It's so close; it's coming up. Dan, thank you as always. Love to have you on. Where can people see more of your work? YouTube.com slash Dan from the internet, YouTube.com slash audio face pod, or just follow me on Twitter where all the Twitter is twit. Time awesome. to have a body. Talk to you later. Dear God. Okay. Anyway, uh, coming up, my death. Also, <laughs> Emma Viglin's gonna be on the Young Turks for all my jokes. It's gonna be awesome. I'm gonna be watching. You should watch along with me. But in just a few minutes, you got indisputable. Uh, with Dr. Rashad Ritchie, go to youtube.com slash indisputable TYT. Wazdi Lambre is gonna be co-hosting, it's gonna be awesome. What have the Karens gotten up to? You can find out in just a few. And until then, stay safe out there, stay sane out there, and I'll see you soon.
Welcome to Indisputable. I'm your host, Dr. Rashad Richard, good to be with you. We have a show today. We're about to get into it. I got a response to Pastor Jesse Lee Peterson, who decided to basically take his whole damn show yesterday to talk trash about me. I have an official statement for the good preacher. Also on the program, we have Andy Hale, civil rights attorney, wrongful conviction attorney. This guy has done some remarkable work around the issue of wrongful convictions in the United States. We're gonna talk to him on the show today. My co-host to break down the news of the day will be none other than Wozni Lombre. We'll get to him in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, let me bring your attention to something that has not received the national attention that it deserves. A New York State trooper killed an 11 year old child. This New York State trooper pulled over a family, a family of four, a father, wife, and two children, 11 and 12. He pulled them over for speeding. It was supposed to be a traffic ticket. It ended up being a death. That state trooper is identified as Christopher Baldner. Let me give you some background to this. Back in December, this family was pulled over by that trooper. There was an argument between the driver, a black male father, and the trooper, according to the report. The driver said, can you please call your supervisor? That's part of the protocol, ladies and gentlemen. You can request a supervisor, it is part of their guidebook protocol. Well, instead of getting a supervisor, this trooper continued to argue with this father. Went back to the squad car, according to the report, cursed at the family. The wife said she was tired. The trooper said, I don't give a F if you're tired, just continued in that same aggression. He went to the squad car, comes back, and he decides to spray mace into the vehicle indiscriminately, spraying the father, the mother, and the 11 and 12 year old in the backseat of the car. Instinctively, the father in fear of his life and the life of his family said this cop is out of control. And he proceeded to pull away from all of this pepper spray being sprayed harming his entire family. Well, this cop decided to break policy, got behind this family, this family. He has already seen there's a wife and two children in the car. And he rammed their vehicle, not once, but twice. He ejected the 11 year old daughter from the car. She died at the scene, she's dead today, she's no more. Look at this beautiful young soul. She's dead over something that should have been a traffic ticket. He was screaming at me, you were going 100 miles per hour, you shook my car. That's according to the father. I said, the tractor trailer in front of me shook your car. I had my hands on the steering wheel. I didn't get out of the car. I was no threat to him, Good said. I asked for a supervisor. The father's name is Tristan Goods. Tristan Goods, 39 years of age, told the New York Daily News that he was driving his wife April and his daughter's 11 year old Monica and 12 year old Tristina to go and visit family. My wife said she was tired. And he said, the cop, I don't give a if you're tired, Good recalled. The trooper returned to his cruiser, and when he returned, he flooded Good's SUV with pepper spray. Bonner records a record show, gave chase and used his state police car to ram the back of Good's SUV about eight seconds later. Good said, Bonner rammed his car a second time. Let's bring up a picture of this father with his daughter. This young man, 39 years of age, was trying to simply protect his family from an out of control cop. I've done some research and I found that this police officer, this state trooper violated company policy. He violated the policy of the New York State Troopers Division because their policy says you do not utilize aggressive tactics and give chase or utilize ram maneuvers in an unsafe manner where they could harm innocent civilians. It is clear that even if he's guilty of a traffic offense, he's not a felon. 
He has no weapons. He is not trying to commit any crime whatsoever. There are children in the car, do they not qualify as innocent civilians? If the black man is not an innocent civilian, does not his wife perhaps qualify as an innocent civilian? This trooper violated policy of his own workplace. And an 11 year old girl is dead today because of it. What do you think happened to him? Do you think he got fired? No. Do you think he got arrested? No. He still has his job. He's on desk duty to this very moment. And this is why people get pissed off about uh, cops and stories like this. Who in the hell you know can violate a company policy and that violation leads to the death of a child and you still have your job the next day? None, there is no profession, none except for policing. Uh, There is a wrongful death suit that has been filed. Um, The Attorney General of New York has launched an investigation into this to talk more about it, to break it down with me. I got my big homie, uh, Waz, big Waz, Waznia, Tuesday and Wednesday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, Remarkable host, great writer for the ringer, the ringer.com. Big Waz, tell me brother, am I seeing this wrong? No, you're seeing it exactly right. And I think the last point you brought up, is the most important one about <laughs> you violate company's policy and it results in the death of a child. You killed a kid in the course of doing your job incorrectly. And yet you get to keep said job. And you know, people watching this at home need to understand that I'm somebody who advocates for workers' rights. I don't believe that you should just lose your job for any old reason, right? Because we see people lose their job for quote unquote embarrassing the company in public, for Facebook posts, for innocuous things. This (laughs) policing, it's one of the most important jobs that we have because we empower these people with the right of the state to kill, right? Like we empower these people with the ultimate power. And so therefore, they should be held to the highest of standards. You know, the standards that it takes to fire a guy who works at McDonald's Mm. for burning a burger or something cannot be much lower than that of a police officer who can behave in this way and kill a child, right? And again, but like what would be the justification for pursuing these people with such force that they might be allowed to run free from a traffic ticket. Would that be so bad for society? Like we're not talking about some ax murderers or some people who escaped prison and killed some people before. These are people accused of going over the speeding limit. And this person pursued them and ran them, literally ran them off the road. And in the police statement, it said, "Oh well, the girl wasn't wearing her seatbelt. That's what they said. This yeah. it's just it's unacceptable. Tremendously unacceptable. And remember, the um the father pulled over in compliance to the traffic mm-hmm. stop. Uh the officer was out of control according to his reports. And given the fact that the officer broke policy, violated protocol of the state troopers division of New York and decided to kill an 11 year old girl and put an entire family at risk. I would say the troopers credibility is definitely in question. And I believe the family, I believe what the family said, right? So you have a situation now where the trooper still is getting paid. The trooper is on desk duty and there's an 11 year old girl dead. And if you can't understand it, I'm talking to everyone who's always pro police. If you can't understand the division right here, that it should not be this difficult to apply a common sense standard to a violation of policy that led to the loss of actual life. But here's what you have, you have these civil servant protection rules that are there because of police unions. You have these qualified immunity rules that are there because of police unions and politicians who are willing to justify them. And now you have literally a killer a killer still carrying a badge and a gun legally, a kid killer at that. All right. Yeah, well, I just wanna say one one last thing, uh, cuz a lot of this is about police culture. Uh, this guy would not act this way if he didn't mm. feel wholly protected 
and you know, sort of absolved from anything he does on duty. You don't behave this way if you believe that there will be consequences to any of your actions. And so when you have a culture where accountability does not exist, people behave like people who will never be held accountable for anything that they do. If you run somebody off the road and kill an 11 year old child and you know you will never be held accountable, this is what we get. Um, the lack of accountability is what breeds this culture. This is a culture of policing. This is why these people go out and behave the way that they do. Very well said. Let me shift gears um, back to the Capitol riots, the terrorist attack. Matt Gates and his continued narrative that somehow critical race theory is the greatest evil in the world, not the terrorist, not the ideology that led to it, but in fact, a advanced theoretical study that's typically taught in advanced level college courses. That's the great evil. But somebody handed him his behind at an official meeting, and it was beautiful to watch. General Mark Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the nation's highest ranking military officer defended the US military against the Republicans criticism of being woke. I hope people understand if you're woke, that means you're not asleep. I don't know if they get that or not. So Milley fired back at lawmakers especially representative Matt Gates. Now keep in mind, Matt Gates is the poster child for the phrase, you need to take several seats. This guy <laughs> is literally being investigated by the federal government for its trafficking an underage child or children and for using cocaine and having some kind of pay for play scheme and damn, the caucasity <laughs> is unbelievable with this guy. And he has the nerve to drill generals of the US military about their own philosophy and ideology and value system. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't believe privilege exists? Matt Gates got it handed to him on this day. Let me take you to the first video. On the issue of critical race theory, etc., I'll obviously have to get much smarter on whatever the theory is. Um, but I do think it's important, actually, uh, for those of us in uniform to be open-minded and be widely read. And the United States Military Academy is a university. Uh, and it is important that we train and we understand. Uh, and I, I want to understand white rage, and I'm white, and I want to understand it. So what is it that caused thousands of people to assault this building and try to overturn the Constitution of the United States of America. What caused that? I want to find that out. I want to maintain an open mind here, and I do want to analyze it. It's important that we understand that because our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and guardians, they come from the American people. So it is important that the leaders now and in the future do understand it. I've read Mao Zedong, I've read, I've read Karl Marx, I've read Lenin. That doesn't make me a communist. So what is wrong? with understanding, having some situational understanding about the country for which we are here to defend. And I personally find it offensive that we are accusing the United States military, our general officers, our commissioned, non-commissioned officers of being quote woke or something else because we're studying some theories that are out there. That was started at Harvard Law School years ago and it proposed that there were laws in the United States, antebellum laws prior to the Civil War that led to a power differential with African Americans that were three quarters of a human being when this country was formed. And then we had a civil war and emancipation proclamation to change it. And we brought it up to the Civil Rights Act in 1964. It took another 100 years to change that. So look at, I do want to know. Damn, and he was not there to answer that question. He knew this knowledge because he did something called research, study. He decided to read up on it, unlike people like Matt Gates. Remember, critical race theory is not taught in K through 12 education. It is an advanced theoretical framework. It is being utilized as a fake pretext in order to provide a context to stop K through 12 educators from teaching children about the truth of racism. That's what it actually does. 
Matt Gates shaking his head at this general for telling him the dogmatic truth. Wozni? You know, I think the general summed it up pretty, quite eloquently there. Uh, that was impressive, honestly. He just basically broke it down like, why would I not want to know about the people who we're protecting? And both, both we're protecting them, and they make up the, you know, the population of the armed services. Why would I not want to know everything about the backgrounds and the thought processes of these people? That was just beautifully and eloquently said. What I do want to talk about, Rashad, is. Man, conservatism has lost its damn way. Because if the January 6th thing is now being called a conspiracy by the FBI, that's a one. Mm -hmm. So now you guys are anti cop. That's one of the pillars of conservatism. We love the damn police. So now y'all anti cop. And y'all anti military now too? You don't like the cops or the military? Like they've compl- they have no ideological incoherence whatsoever. This is baffling to me that yeah. in the same week Louis Gomert comes out on the floor <laughs> and he perpetuates a preposterous conspiracy theory, the next week you got a lightweight, not even just inexperienced intellectually and as you mentioned you got them boys on your head now, boy. You got mm-hmm. the boys is after you now. You trafficking all kinds of people, doing all kinds of things at all kinds of sex parties, right? Now they on top of you. You're going after generals in the military, the people who pay the ultimate sacrifice, the people who we call our heroes. They're lost. They lost their way, Rashad. This is really ironic, right? Because right now, what you literally have is a Republican Party that is becoming a mirror reflection of the ideology of Donald Trump. And what is Trump's ideology? He has no true ideology. It's all over the place, just like you described. So let me get this right. Republicans are now anti-capital police. They are anti-FBI. They are anti-US military. And they are anti-investigating crimes against the United States government. This is who they are today. And this is what I call political schizophrenia. Because there is no way possible this kind of ideology could make sense to someone who's actually sane. Yeah, (laughs) it's been happening for a while, right? The party has slowly but surely been ceding power to what used to be considered the quote unquote fringe of Mm -hmm. the right wing. These guys are now at the seat of power. It's no longer your Romney types, your Jeb Bush types, your George Bush types, or even your Newt Gingrich types, who's very responsible for this crazy strain. Um, you know, we saw it when John McCain let Sarah Palin be his running mate, and everybody's like, I thought John McCain was a sensible one. He mm-hmm. was he was already giving it up to the lunatic fringe. We saw it when, you know. All of a sudden, the black guy comes into office and we start talking about tightening our belts with loose and reckless spending. We know the dog whistles. Yeah. We know what's going on about whenever you hear frivolous spending from a certain type of white person, you know they're talking (laughs) about welfare. You know what they're talking about. And so, slowly but surely, they've ceded so much power. So the people that used to be considered the fringe, and now it's basically a tail is wagging the dog. And that's why somebody as serious as a General Milley, he finds himself in front of Congress answering questions posed by the likes of Matt Gates. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah, quite, quite. All right, we got more on the other side. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, on the other side, I'm going to break down this uh, Jesse Lee Peterson thing. I had him on the program a few days ago, I kicked him off the show. I stand by my decision. He decided to make a show about me kicking him off the show. And it illuminates why you and I should continue to work as hard as we can to make sure every American has access to mental health care. All right, we got more on the other side, indisputable. I'm Nina Turner, and we are on the road to revolution, baby. (laughs) Hello, somebody. And I know 
sometimes people talk about the angry black woman, but I'm going to tell you something. If you ain't mad as a mofo about what's going on here, something is wrong with you. When people ask me all the time, what are the lessons from 2020, is that progressives have to get more organized and we got to come together. We have to be as agile as neoliberals. The progressive movement has to understand that it's not just enough for us to have the right ideas. We are right on most of the ideas. We're not perfect, but we're 99% right because it is a humanitarian agenda, but we must get the power. We have to come together in a more unified way so that we utilize our power strategically to topple neoliberalism, and it's gonna happen. Hi, I'm John, and I'm new to TikTok, but about three years ago, I started my daily political news show, The Damage Report, because I noticed this trend where every morning I was waking up to this tsunami of news that was just generally dreadful and horrifying and shocking, and I thought that if I could spend my time helping people to navigate this, serving as a bit of a life raft, pointing out which news is important and why, there are worse ways to spend your day. We're not an average news show, and we don't want our TikTok presence to be average either, so feel free to let us know what you'd like to, us to do on the platform, and maybe give us a follow at The Damage Report. All right, Amazon Prime members, here's how you can subscribe for free on Twitch. Start by linking your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account, and then click that little subscribe or resubscribe button below the stream on Twitch. Scroll down and select the subscribe free with Prime button, and then you're finished. Close out immediately and share your little subscription alert with the chat. Send a cute message along with it and bathe in the sweet, twitchy, Bezos-funded love. Hashtag Bezos Bucks. Hey everyone, Matteo Scarapo here, author of Black Buck, which is Shop TYT's first fiction book ever. I'm honored. So, Black Buck is about a young man named Darren who's living in bed Brooklyn. He lives with his mom, he has his girlfriend, he has his best friend, he has his neighborhood, and his neighborhood has him. Darren's also working at a Starbucks in Midtown Manhattan. And one day, this man, real suave and good looking, comes in and asks Darren to give him his regular. But for some reason, Darren says no. This man named Rhett Daniels, who's the CEO of a startup called Someone, located on the 36th floor of the same building, is impressed. And he invites Darren upstairs, and then he extends an offer to join his elite sales team. Darren reluctantly joins, and he soon realizes that he's not the only black salesperson there. He's the only black person in the entire company. So he goes through hell and back in order to make it to the top. And once there, he has status, money, power, but he says, you know what? I don't like being the token black guy. So he hatches a plan to help other people of color infiltrate America's tech startup sales teams, redefining what it means to be a minority in the workplace. This book definitely, if you couldn't tell, touches on many things um, that are relevant to this moment that we're all living in right now, but it's also connected to the many moments in history that have come before today. I hope that you read it, I hope that you enjoy it, and if you wanna order a copy, go to shoptyt.com. Thank you, be well, and happy 2021. Welcome back to Indisputable. Make sure you are subscribing. It is free, it is simple, it is easy to the Indisputable TYT page on YouTube. Make sure you join us live there uh, every weekday, same bat time, same bat place, all right? Make sure you go to Indisputable TYT. Uh, if you are watching me from TDR or anywhere else, make sure you subscribe to Indisputable TYT. I think we're at 95,000, our goal was 100,000, we are close to that, hell, we can do that today. Uh, make sure you subscribe ASAP, Indisputable TYT. Follow us on all social media, keeping you informed both on air and off air, Indisputable TYT. I'm gonna read some of these comments, okay? Uh, and thank you all for uh, engaging with the program. Uh, don't forget the Economic Justice Town Hall, June 26th. That is in Cleveland, Ohio. We have our dear sister, Senator Nina Turner, uh, co-hosted by Killer Mike, 
uh, Jank, and, and this is going to be one of those just amazing town halls. If you're anywhere near that area, you need to sign up. Visit tyt.com slash events to RSVP and for more details. Uh, you can also watch the event live on the 26th, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Pacific Time um, on the main show, Facebook, Twitch, and tyt.com. All right. Okay, let's get to it. Uh, TYT member Shikata. Ganai, maybe, I think I said that right, says in an age of GPS, computer, cell phones, radios, and video video cameras, traffic stops are not necessary. Nobody can outrun a camera and GPS. And he wasn't, remember, he wasn't trying to outrun the traffic stop. He was trying to get away from the pepper spray and get his children away and wife away from the pepper spray. Uh, Super chat, Alan Smith says, I'm an electrician. My work has um, the potential to kill someone. If I found out my work, Found out my work uh, kill a worker. I, I think killed a child. You won't have the chance to fire me because I'm going to quit. If I I got it. If I found out my work killed a child, I understand that. Okay. Um, thank you for the comment. Desiree Dewitt says, Doctor R, you are so effing brilliant. I love your show. Keep slaying those conservatives. Well, thank you, uh, Karen Venus. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Forbzilla Waz. I took your last response as I need to keep blowing up your Insta until you reply, my love. Damn, <laughs> she, she dropping it like that in the inbox. I don't know, man. I mean, the DM is what it is. Okay, non-human humanist, you need to stop ignoring people, Was Non-human humanist says, does the good family, uh, does the good fa- good family have a GoFundMe? Uh, I think they do, and you can Google that. I do believe they have a GoFundMe set up. Yes, um, and um, we'll put the link in the description of the video on YouTube and Facebook. So that's what we'll do, so you can find how to contribute to that GoFundMe. Okay, Neil Fox Com says the disdain that these cops show black people is no different than slave patrols. Yeah, okay. All right, um, I gotta move on. I'll read some more comments in just a little bit. Ladies and gentlemen, let me bring your attention to uh, the bullpen we had a few days ago with conservative pastor <laughs> Jesse Lee Peterson. Okay, that my producers did that and that's hella funny. I wish a Karen would, yes. Jesse Lee Peterson was the ultimate Karen. He is playing the ultimate Karen now. So if you were not tuned into that show, uh, the bullpen segment is obviously typically the debate segment. We literally give the debate guest the topics that we're going to talk about. Why? Because I want you to be able to know what we're talking about, research it, have an informed opinion about it, and engage in a good faith dialogue, a good faith debate. Well, this individual, Jesse Lee Peterson, decided not to do that. He wanted to come on my show and bash gay people, black people. Lesbians, that's what he wanted to do. Uh, he did not want to engage in a good faith debate. So he decided after I kicked him off the show to do a whole show about me kicking him off the show. And I do have a response uh, to this conservative clown. Um, let me first remind you of some of the things that happened on that show. He is the founder of White History Month. And when I brought this up, notice my face. Because I almost lost my composure laughing, not with him, but laughing at him. Here it is. Sir, you all have a celebration coming up next month. Um, Are you not the founder of um, White History Month, I think, which starts in July? Yeah, we're gonna be celebrating our fourth year of White History Month Mm -hmm. in July. (laughs) And the the reason that we started it in July is because if you notice, July just feels white. Yeah. You know, it's it's summertime, vacation time, relaxing Uh time, reflecting time, and appreciating the greatest country on this side of heaven. Gotcha. And uh, so we are recognizing that and showing our appreciation for it. I think it's important for people to know um, you're not a comedian. (laughs) Yeah, he's not a comedian. He was serious about White History Month and the celebration of it. Now he bashed Juneteenth and he has the typical Sean Hannity talking points about other things, but he goes even more extreme. Now remember, I literally make sure he has or any debate guest they have 
what we're talking about. They have the topics. My production team, greatest on the planet. They make sure that their people receive all of the topics that we will discuss. It's very fair and it's very transparent. I asked them about the policy discussion that we were supposed to have in reference to the George Floyd Police Again Accountability Act. Well, here's his response. What in the policy of the George Floyd Policing Act do you disagree with? The whole idea, what Which really needs- part of the policy, Jesse? Blaming the cops and no responsibility Jesse, for the blacks. I'm asking you, what part of the policy is written? You can find it at congress.gov. What part of the policy, sir, do you disagree with? This is a simple question. I disagree with the whole idea of a policy. You haven't policy. read the policy. I you haven't even read the damn policy. Come I on, I don't Jesse. need to read it. I don't need to read you it don't to know need the to truth read it. because what I've noticed is that black people today, due to their lack of love, their lack of believing in God, mm -hmm. they love evil more than they love good, so right? So that's the reason and why so you don't read. And so the that's fact, the reason why you don't read. Right, because we're written by no good black people. That's what he said. That's the reason why he doesn't read is because policies are written by no good black people, or at least that policy was not worthy of his research. Now remember, we always make sure that the guest receives everything they need in order to engage in an intellectual debate about the topic or the policy. His people are failing him at his workplace, they are failing him. Now, this is what Jesse Lee Peterson said about me. It was on the Young Turk Network, Young Turks Network. And the show was called Indisputable. And I had no idea how the show was gonna go. As I do with all things now, I have a wait and see attitude. Most of the time, I don't even, you know, most of the time I may ask my uh, uh, PR guy, well, what do they want to talk about? And he'll tell me what they want to talk about. I do no research, I don't write down notes, I have no pre planned idea of what I'm going to, how I'm going to respond, or what I'm going to say, right? That's a damn shame. It's not just a shame that he literally said, and I quote, I do no research. It's a damn shame that he has people following him for information. Ladies and gentlemen, um, he decided to go on and attack Black Lives Matter. Um, he utilized terminology that was offensive uh, and truly did not live up to a serious program. So I did what I had to do and here's that. What's about what is it about Black Lives Matter uh, that you disagree with fundamentally? Black Lives Matter was founded by a bunch of fat black radical lesbians. Okay, and who All hate right, have God? A good, get this clown off my show. I appreciate who you. Who hate for being God? Who hate the nuclear you, family? Yeah. Listen, for those of you who wanted me to continue to engage that clown on this show, I'm sorry, I just couldn't do it. I'm only a human being, so please <laughs> forgive me. Okay. All right. Um, here's what we'll do for the rest of the show. Um, I will read some comments, and and I know some of you will say, "Oh, Rashad, that was just so rude." And and yeah, it was. I, I couldn't take any more of that foolishness. He's not going to make a debate in good faith, even if, even if you oppose whatever I believe on the most extreme policy side. At least you have a policy argument. I can engage in a good faith debate about ideas. But if you want to utilize this platform to bash gay people, to bash black people, to bash communities that are disenfranchised, if that's all you want to do, then no, you won't do that here. So Jesse Lee Peterson, he had his cronies just as I predicted. Uh, they started tagging me on social media, calling me a beta male. Uh, that's the language they speak over there. And uh, saying that I uh, ran away from Jesse Lee Peterson. So here's what Jesse Lee Peterson told his followers to do if they encountered me. So if you see Dr. Rashad Ritchie walking down the road, ask him, ask him why did he put a tail between his legs? And run from Jesse Lee Peterson. 
He invited me on the show. I didn't invite myself. You would think he would have been ready. Are you ready? Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Are you ready? Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Be also ready. The man says he does not read. He says he does not research. He's all over the place mentally. If he did not have that damn show, he would be unemployed and homeless. What other skill does he have? Nothing. Now here's my official response to whatever crony he may send my way. Here's my response back to Jesse Lee Peterson. Sit your $5 ass down before I make change. Switching topics. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish a Karen would. You know what we do. We go across the United States of America and we highlight the Karens of the world. Now this one is a little different. I have asked my producers to block out the face of this Karen because she's simply a Karen in training. I'm actually going to focus not only on her words, but on her parents because obviously her parents have failed her. This is a child who has decided because of the manipulation of her parents to spew the same racist dogma that she has been taught, a Karen in training. This very demanding nine year old recently confronted her Minnesota school board about political Amanda Gorman and BLM posters hung at her elementary school. She attended the meeting to give public comment because the school board previously said there will be no political posters at her school. Now I want you to remember, I'm not bashing this nine year old. I'm bringing your attention to the fact that this is how parents are teaching their children. And instead of the parents having the decency, the courage to speak to this school board directly, what do they do? They send their nine year old daughter with their talking points to this school board meeting. Here's the first video. The other day I was walking down the hallway at Lakeview Elementary School to give a teacher a retiring gift. I looked up onto the wall and saw a BLM poster and an Amanda Gorman poster. In case you don't know who that chick is, she's some girl who did a poem at Biden's so-called inauguration. I was so mad. I was told two weeks ago at this very meeting spot, no politics in school. I believed what you said at this meeting. So at lunch, I went up to my principal to tell him about the BLM poster and that I wanted it down. He said it's not coming down. I was like, yeah, it is, because the school board said on May 25th, no BLM or politics in school. He said, that's weird. They were the, one who, they were the ones who made them. I was stunned. Does that sound like a nine-year-old wrote that speech? She's calling another grown individual, Amanda Gorman, that chick. Does it sound like a nine year old sat down and wrote that speech? Of course not. Um, it actually gets worse. Now, if you don't believe that this speech was written by her mother, I want to bring your attention to a very classic theme, a very classic theme of Karen's. The fact that they actually have black friends and they see no color. Here it is. I do not judge people by the color of their skin. I, I don't really care what color their hair, skin, or eyes is. I judge by the content or the way they treat me. MLK said, I have a dream that one day my four little children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That dream has come true. I do not care or look at the color of skin, but you make me think of it. I have Asian, Mexican, white, Chinese, black friends, and I don't care. It's a damn shame, her parents have failed her. Now once again, my attention is not to this nine year old. That's why I decided to make sure her face is blurred out for this program. But this is the unfortunate reality of what is being taught to children across this country. And shame on these parents for not having the fortitude to simply address the school board themselves but instead using their nine year old daughter in their racial rant against that institution. Waz? 
It's sad that these grownups don't have the courage of their own convictions and couldn't just go up to the school board themselves and say this themselves, right? Why would you send your child as some sort of spokesperson or press secretary mm. to spew the ridiculous, hateful language? And what I will say about even something like a Black Lives Matter poster, it's it's interesting why people feel so attacked by that phrase. Just the I like Nobody's even talking about the reader <laughs> on the poster, right? You can, whoever can read it. It's just a statement of fact, right? I don't know why anybody would feel so sensitive or scandalized that a poster would say that Black Lives Matter. You should be saying right on, because yeah. <laughs> I believe that that's true. Instead, obviously, a lot of these people just, you can tell they're just jumping out with their sensitivity because of the fact that they really don't like black people. They don't want to hear that Black Lives Matter because to them, they don't. Yeah, man, I got to get this uh, story in. I know we're at the end of the segment. I'm going. <sighs> What in the redneck hell? Okay, I did not believe it until I saw it. Uh, there's a, I guess, festivity, um, a five day country party that organizers promised would feature mud, music, and mayhem. Well, they delivered on that promise. Now, it had a lot of drugs, a lot of meth, a lot of alcohol, and a whole lot of violence. Uh, one individual, um, was I think cut by what the <laughs> what the paper says was a friend. Let me just go to the quote. Um, this is from Blake Montgomery Yahoo, Yahoo News. One person slit a friend's throat. First of all, no, that's not your friend <laughs> if he slit your throat. But here's how it's reported. One person slit a friend's throat and remains at large. A 29 year old man had allegedly strangled a woman until she passed out. One person lost the better part of a finger and another one was impaled when he drove a um, side by side over two to three inch long uh, inch log that broke through the bottom of the recreational vehicle and, and the list goes on. Uh, here's some of that video. Redneck Outdoor Adventures, one of the best YouTube, YouTube right now. If you ain't subscribed, subscribe, you a sucker butt ass sucker. <laughs> People were beaten, stabbed, lost limbs, strangled until they fell out. And the uh, sheriff said, I'm not for them being shut down. I just want the patrons to behave lawfully. Now I wonder if this shindig would have been all black. Would the sheriff have said the exact same thing about all of this mayhem that happened? Waz, before you go, man, I gotta get your opinion on it. You know, <laughs> I'll say this, that's not my culture. I know you'd be shocked to learn that, <laughs> Rashad. <laughs> that's not my culture and I don't profess to know very much about redneck culture. So I'm not gonna comment on cars with no doors on them and people crashing into them for recreation. That's cool, you know, like it's none of my business. Whatever you do in your leisure is fine, but I will say, Violence or crime is only tolerated in this country when it's perpetuated by white people. I think the reason why you see gun laws the way they are is because white people need to have the right to be violent. I think you see, you know, the drug wave of opioids and all of that, all of the death that's associated with it. It's treated with care and not, you know, a war on the opioid epidemic because it's a white problem. There's two separate rules in this country for white people and non-whites. This is just another example of that paradigm. Another highlight, uh, brother. It is always a pleasure having you on the program. Tell everyone how they can follow you and check out your amazing show. 
Yeah, man, just follow me at B-I-G-W-O-S on every single social media platform that it is. I'm uniform in that respect. Make sure you subscribe to the Woke Bros podcast with me and Nando Vila, another TYT contributor who everybody obviously loves. And you can check my, you know, read my stuff at the Ringer. Check out the Ringer NBA show if you're into the, the NBA at all. Uh, yeah, that's that's it. That's all I got for you, Rashad. <laughs> man, always a pleasure, brother. Thank you, Almy, for being on the show. Thank you, you're killing it guys. Thanks man, it's a team effort as you know. Um, I do have in the bullpen today, uh, former US Congressman Trey Radel, a Republican out of Florida. Uh, we're going to talk about policy, actual policy debates will happen in the bullpen today. Uh, also, we have Andy Hale, uh, who will be on the show in just a few minutes talking about wrongful convictions, stick and stay, it's indisputable. We are on to something that is going to be amazing. But what we need is your help. The number one problem is there's too much power in too few hands. Every single problem that we have can be traced back to dark money. They take large donors, they serve large donors. So these handful of gatekeepers try to dictate everything. Like all of you already know, they don't work for you, they work for their donors. So fire them and hire people who will only work for you that say no corporate back money. We are going to change the way we elect candidates in this country. Uncorrupted Democrats, we're gonna fight for the issues and win on policy. This is incredibly personal. We need free health care for everyone. We're fighting for $15 minimum wage, single payer health care, debt free college, and we are gonna get money out of politics once and for all. I've taken a public pledge not to accept any corporate money. Because the last thing we're gonna do is go into another presidential election and run a corporatist against a populist candidate. At some point, the buck needs to stop and it's gonna stop with us. It's gonna stop with Justice Democrats. So who are we? People who do not take corporate PAC money. We're relying on small donors. 99.9% .9 of our contributions came from people. You're a Justice Democrat, so you don't take any corporate PAC money. I'm not influenced by money. As a Justice Democrat, <laughs> I made that pledge. It's not a penny. Absolutely not. I will go to Congress unbossed and unbought. We try to create a government which works for all of us. That is what America is about, and that's what a representative democracy should be about. We are just getting warmed up here. Vote for uncorrupted Democrats. Democrats. The fight starts now, it starts today, and it starts with you. I've been honest with him, like, yeah, I was upset with you and I should have done it. But instead, I was like, I'm just trying to protect my engagement ring. <laughs> Did you know that more than 20% of the world's oxygen comes from the Amazon? Why? Because of trees. I know what you're thinking. Of course. So what do we want to do? We want to plant more trees so we can save the climate. It's quite literal. So that's what leads to our new partner, Plant Your Change. Um, love it. It's so easy. What they do is you take the credit or debit cards you already have and you plug it into the system. And if you ch so choose, you get to round up every purchase to the nearest dollar and they plant a tree for you, okay? Now you could also choose if you wanna do it on only certain kinds of uh, purchases or only so often, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. But literally every cent makes a difference here. It's plant your change. And if you wanna know more information, just go to tyt.com slash trees. Let's go save the planet together. Now, top. No. No. No.
today, a terrible day for the internet, a terrible day for America. The internet as we know it is not going to exist anymore. A real dark day for information and yet another way that they're bleeding out the democracy. We're now going to have these gatekeepers of information deciding what we can and can't see and that's what scares me the most. Whether you're conservative or progressive or anywhere in the middle, this is the one thing we should all agree to. Protect the internet because the establishment is coming for it. Don't let them destroy the internet. Welcome back to Indisputable. Let me read some of these comments. We got a lot of them. Uh, don't forget to always follow us on social media. Indisputable TYT, Indisputable TYT. And on the YouTube page, subscribe, it's free, it's easy. Make it happen, Indisputable TYT, Indisputable TYT. Okay, a uh, member, I read that one. Okay, um, Super Chat, Omega Shinron Dragon says, the good doctor with the pen is giving me Watchmen vibes. Me Asa Dragon says, I feel sorry for children who are not taught to think for themselves. All people, race be damned, gender identity be damned. Please think for yourselves, great advice. Uh, Mama Bear Dragon says, Uncle Ruckus, that's who he is, real life Uncle Ruck Ruckus. Well, he's definitely the inspiration behind him, for sure. Okay, uh, Donna W says, Jesse Peterson is a buffoon. Um, love JJ 1814 uh, singing, okay. Yeah, he just, who in the hell just breaks out in song? No warning whatsoever and can't sing. Lauren Mary Flores says, Flores says, and people listen to him, they more like laugh at him and they pay him to continue a comedy routine that he thinks is serious. Uh, Mary Bell says that kid watches Fox News with her parents, perhaps. Lawrence Wells, they are poisoning their kids with these terrible messages. There needs to be an intervention. Yep, comments about the cop story. Uh, he violated, uh, excuse me, red light robot says he violated policy, but also human dignity, good point. Abuse of authority is typically enabled and I doubt this was his first instance, agreed. Mr. Sushi 22. Any other job, you're fired immediately, that's correct. Uh, Richard uh, Rivera says he took a child's life for a $125 ticket. Yeah, Twitch, uh, thank you all subscriber. Uh, Green Bean 906 resubscribe for five months, thank you. Um, celebrated with Dr. Richie, five months, I thank you. Um, Bohemian Dragon Tiger Lily gifted a sub, thank you. A redneck rave, regular mole red dragon cheer, 234 business said, that's a normal weekend out there. And yes, uh, TYT got the new segment in today, gal for 71, thank you so much. Okay, all right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's talk about somebody doing very important work uh, and making a real impact in the criminal justice system. I have Andy Hale, civil rights and wrongful conviction attorney, uh, documentary producer. And his documentary, A Murder in the Park, Wrongful Convictions and the Death Penalty. We're gonna talk about that and more. Uh, Andy, thank you for being on Indisputable. Great to be here, thanks for having me. Absolutely, let's first talk about your passion for this kind of work. Where did it come from? You know, it's interesting, uh, I've been practicing law for over 30 years. Uh, the last 15 years or so was defending Chicago police officers in civil rights lawsuits. I get hired as outside counsel. Um, but I heard about a case where there was a guy that I thought was wrongfully convicted. And it was an incredible story. He had been trying to prove his innocence for 10 years. And a friend of mine, we decided to make a documentary about it. We had never done that. And incredibly, the documentary um, really resonated with the state's attorney's office. It shined a light on his case. It basically led to this man, Al Story Simon, getting released from prison. And that just kind of gave me the impetus to want to use documentary storytelling to shine a light on wrongful conviction cases and social justice issues. You were able to transform the narrative of an entire human being because you decided to pay attention to some things and do something about it. Tell us how that has opened 
your, I guess, legal practice and legal philosophy um, as it relates to criminal justice systems in America? Well, what, what I really found out was if you are in prison and you are innocent, mm-hmm. it is so hard to get anybody to listen to you, to get anybody to help you. And what I found is unfortunately, sometimes we need the power of the media. Sometimes we need the power of a documentary to tell the story, to tell the full story that people haven't seen or heard. And that can cause state's attorneys to do the right thing. They should do it on their own. But what I found is the documentary films on wrongful convictions can really be powerful. And then just to finish that thought, when Al Story Simon got his conviction vacated, he told me about his best friend in prison, a guy named Cleve Heidelberg. He said, hey, can you look at his case? He's innocent too. So we made a documentary movie about that case. It's almost done, it'll probably be out later this year. And I was able to get his conviction vacated after seven years in prison. So it's just kind of this, I think through, through shining a light on these cases through documentary filmmaking, I've been able to help guys who, take Cleve Heidelberg. Half a century, this guy had been saying he was innocent. Nobody was listening. You know, it 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 took something more. And once I did that, and I I was there when somebody walked out of prison. There's no better feeling for a lawyer. I don't think there's any higher calling you can do in legal work. Me personally, and I've been doing this now for 30 years. And so that's my time is valuable. That's where I want to spend my time helping guys in prison who shouldn't be there. Let's talk about the dysfunction that leads to these wrongful convictions. Because in the system, you you are expected to have defense counsel, even if you cannot afford it. There's a prosecutor who literally takes an oath to uphold justice, not to simply prosecute. There's a judge who takes an oath to uphold the constitution and justice, not simply to ignore evidence. And then you have another chain of command. You have the police officers, you have the investigators. How is it? that out of roughly five to eight entities that are involved in a court case, how is it that every single one of them got it wrong in these cases? You have dysfunction on every part of the case because I think it starts a lot of times with public defenders. There's a great documentary called Gideon's Army. I'd recommend people watch that. It profiles three public defenders. They got a caseload of like a thousand cases. You get a public defender, they're doing a great job. They're they're earnest, they're hardworking, but How much time do they have for a thousand cases? So that's the first part. You have state's attorneys who are mandated to seek justice, not just to convict, but they don't follow that mandate. They do wanna just convict and they're biased. They're not seeking the truth. I mean, police officers admittedly are biased. They investigate a crime, they turn it over to the state's attorney's office, okay? They want it prosecuted. The state's attorney's office is our, our gatekeeper. They can either accept charges, reject charges, or say keep investigating. And so I think too many times state's attorneys just wanna get the conviction too. And then you know sometimes you have evidentiary issues that happen and jury issues and it's it's a perfect storm. You are providing what I call a significant remedy, but it is not a system remedy. What is the system remedy to stop this from happening? I think the system remedy, one of the biggest things I I preach on is I think it's accountability. It's kind of consistent with a little bit with the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act, where one of the things in that act, they want to have a national database of problematic police officers. Mm -hmm. I think here in Chicago, and I've I've defended dozens of Chicago police officers, 13,000 officers, right? 10% is 1,300, 1% is 130. You got 1% of the guys that are that are bad apples, but those guys are wreaking a lot of havoc. And you know what, we all know who they are. The department knows who they are and we don't properly weed those guys out. And there has to be accountability. Let's take the Derek Chauvin case with George Floyd. Not only Derek Chauvin, what he did was outrageous and egregious, but what about the guys just standing there, just watching, who didn't think to come over and say, hey buddy, get your knee off his neck. That's not proper. Like. They did that despite the fact that Darnella Frazier's videotaping that. Yeah. Because they feel like clearly there's gonna be no accountability. Mm-hmm. To be that brazen, to do that for nine minutes and nobody steps in. So I think accountability in my mind is one of the biggest issues. It is said that evil does not prevail simply because bad men do bad things. 
but because good men sit back and do nothing. And I would challenge that argument and say, if you sit back and do nothing, you're not a good person at all. Um, how can people check out your documentary and your upcoming work? So the easiest way is uh, my website, the law firm is hailmonaco.com. That's hail, H-A-L-E-M-O-N-I-C-O. We've got my bio there, we got a media page. It shows the murder in the park, the Cleve Heidelberg documentary that's coming out. We got another one coming out about a guy named Chester Weger who was in prison for 60 years. And I got a couple guys that I'm trying to help that I wanna do documentaries for. Um, that I got to get slotted in there. And so that's probably the best way to, to see all our media projects. Andy, I mean this when I say it, brother. Uh, indisputable supports you. If you need help with something, you reach out to this team, okay? I will do that and I will take it. I, I will take you up on that. Thank you, you my friend. Me. <laughs> Please do. Uh, continue to the great work. We appreciate your time on Indisputable. Thanks for having me on. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we got more on the other side. The bullpen is coming up. Former Congressman Trey Rado steps in the ring to talk about Florida and what he calls the new rising star of the Republican Party, Governor DeSantis. We got more. I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm at a uh, wolf pack gathering. We're growing. I see faces that I recognize, but I also see a lot of faces that I that I don't recognize, and that's that's fantastic. We are all taking time out of our lives to be here, and that's amazing. That means we truly believe in this. Make no mistake, everyone in this room is a leader in a wolf pack. Alaska, West Virginia, Montana, Georgia, Massachusetts, New York. Uh, New Jersey, everyone is here. All these folks paid with their own money and sometimes took vacation days to come here uh, to strategize on how to get our democracy back and get money out of politics. Or you get more political power just because you have more money. This is why it requires a constitutional amendment. The process of winning in your state next year doesn't begin when session begins. It begins right now. So work to a goal, something this big that you're actually making a difference of. There's very few things in the world that really compare to that feeling. Equal rights to fair representation, rights for human beings, anti-corruption laws, and free and fair elections. That's what we are fighting for. What were the founding fathers? Revolutionaries. And they built revolution into the document. So Article 5 is the way we have to go. This is how you do it. You're in this as a team, you're in this together. The fight will always continue. That fight is not between the left and the right. That fight is between basically greed and humanity. So I'm asking you to put differences aside, whether you're conservative or independent or progressive, to join forces to say no more corruption. When you get beyond the fear, you take that first step and you'll change the world. What I wanna leave you with, of course, is hope. And I wanna assure you that if we keep fighting together, we're gonna to win together. We're gonna to get that convention, we're gonna get that amendment, and we're gonna get our democracy back. Come join us, wolf-pack.com. Sharp increase in healthcare insurance premiums next year in response to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. The country is desperate for Medicare for all, but the mainstream media will tell you nonstop lies about how people don't want it. Between 5.8 million and 23 million lost their healthcare just during this pandemic. And Joe Biden says, no, I don't think that's an argument for Medicare for all. How are you gonna find $35 trillion? They constantly misstate things, but without explaining that the current system costs at least 50 trillion. Every other developed nation has a single payer system and they all pay less. In fact, on average, they pay about half of what we pay. It doesn't matter if taxes go up, if your health care costs go way, way down. The for-profit health insurance companies are simply a scam price gouging you and they're in between you and your doctor. Look guys, the good news is we're gonna win. We're gonna get Medicare for all. A famous new author has a book out, his name is Dogen Uger, that's my dad. Okay, the name of the book is called The Original Young Turk and it's his life story. I read it, trust me, you're gonna love it. He has such a straightforward way of telling stories that you're gonna be amused by it. It's like, well, then I met JFK, then I was at the White House, then I started a business, then I became businessman of the year. <laughs> it's amazing. You're gonna love the stories and it's part of what made me progressive. Check it out at shoptyt.com. It is wrong to deny any of your fellow Americans the right to vote 
in this country. Look, I tell you guys, most important thing is voting in primaries. Primaries, primaries, primaries. I hope every American will vote. Will vote for the candidate and party of his choice, but vote. We cannot continue to complain about corruption and complain about what's happening in this country and continue to vote for it. Let's get it right this time. It could be a moment of redemption for what happened in 2016. Welcome back to Indisputable. Let's go to some of these comments. All right, and remember to follow us on social media, Indisputable TYT. Join the YouTube page, Indisputable TYT. Let's make it happen. All right, TYT member, New York Rican says, by the way, Dr. Rashad Rich, you have my favorite news show going on. Keep it pushing. Well, thank you for that, uh, YouTube. Rajan Savini says, Dr. Rashad, love the piece, the class of conversation, the directness of fact, and the whoosh of Karen Wood piece. Keep fighting for truth, brother. Thank you for that, and I shall. Um, how to stay hopeful. Aquarius Dragon says, sigh, how can one appeal to the better side of humanity when so much is evil? Uh, Anna Anna says, there is so much wrong going on these days. I feel helpless and hopeless. I can't. It can't be too soon to have real major change. Um, I agree with you, continue to fight the good fight. I want you to remember this, there is nothing final in a democracy. You always get an opportunity to transfer people if you cannot pressure them, all right? Uh, wrongful convictions, police reform, uh, Yaoun Fleming says, sounds amazing, the department would never weed them out. Um, Custo Kriakopoulos, what's interesting is uh, those in power get everyone down the rung to go after each other rather than coming together to take them on. Uh, James Moore uh, about the redneck rave. That rave was not quite Mad Max, more like upset Gerald. <laughs> that's, that's funny. Uh, DeSantis, uh, Prince of Judah 79 says, LOL, Republicans have a new savior. Zachary Fluke, oh boy, my state's governor. Uh, 003 Adam underscore at 300. Wow, Dr. Richard interviewing someone that's compassionate and logical and just. And it was all of that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. In the bullpen today, we got former US Congressman Trey Radel out of the state of Florida. We're going to chop it up about policies connected to DeSantis, who is, yes, a rising star, I guess. In the Republican Party, uh, Trey. Good day. Thank you for being on Indisputable. Always great to be with you, my man. Okay, uh, let me first start <laughs> with uh, your support. I think of Governor DeSantis. Why do you support him? What policies do you stand behind? Where do we start? Uh, so I would start big picture, just very generally speaking. Um, uh, as a conservative, and I would also say that Governor DeSantis, uh, who's around my age and I consider a friend, I was sworn into Congress with him. Uh, he is a libertarian leaning conservative. And what that means is he believes in some of the things that you and I have talked about, which include police reform, uh, which include, uh, while he has not been public uh, about this, I, I know that uh, he has expressed his views about the war on drugs and other things, again, that you and I have talked about. Uh, what I love mostly is that our state, while well, New York and California and others were put into senseless lockdowns, putting families out of work, unemploying people, <laughs> locking them down into their homes, and all of the horrific things that we saw come with that, Governor DeSantis kept our state open. And he did so because he followed the science. And the science still today is vindicating him, mm. showing that our unemployment rate uh, is low, our economy is booming, and we didn't have to destroy our economy or our state, and we were still open. And yet, our numbers when it comes to hospitalizations and infection rates of COVID are basically equal to about California and other states that locked down hardcore. And we did way better than New York. Yeah, let's argue some of the nuance here. So, number one, you have basically 
claimed on this show uh, that Governor DeSantis is in fact um, close to being libertarian like yourself. Uh, here's in the, some ways now. Okay, well, well let me ask you way. about this way then. Uh, because typically you guys are not for creating new laws. Um, you all do not want additional government intrusion through statute. However, Governor DeSantis has passed a flurry of new laws, uh, one of them making it a felony to protest and block traffic. Also giving civil immunity to pro to individuals who run over protesters who are blocking traffic. And then he creates a new slew of laws that will mandate the teaching of communism as evil in curriculum in Florida. All of these are laws, new laws that are really, come on man, those laws are silly as hell. Especially if you are a libertarian who believes in self-regulation rather than the government telling you how to behave. Where am I wrong here? Uh, you're not, the, the communism thing, let's set that aside for a second. Um, in terms of enhancing the block traffic thing, I think that they're creating a felony where there wasn't much of a problem. Look, let me also uh, share some of the- So you're saying critical. that that was wrong, like you're saying yeah, that was wrong but, to do. Let me okay. look, you, you love, I think, you like to have me on here, especially when when you get to have me slam Republicans. No, and I will slam this. Trey, suit. come on, don't I, I, don't do that. Trey, you literally told my producers this is what you wanted to talk about. I said no, 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 I yes. No. Okay. So, so that look, man, I'm I'm just having a little fun with you here. So okay. I'll be critical of this Republican-controlled legislature in some of the other things that they're doing. I am very apprehensive about having the government step in and start telling private businesses how to do their business. So let me give you two examples here in the state of Florida. Well, before you get to those examples. Uh, just really quickly, yeah, because sure. you you said that you were critical of the Republican-controlled Florida legislature. But remember, uh, Governor DeSantis, your friend, pushed the legislation and signed the le legislation, and then held a press conference about the legislation. Are you also critical of Governor DeSantis, who in oh, fact is the okay? So he's the catalyst behind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, too. You know, I'll be critical of everybody, including hardest on myself. The other things that Republicans have done that I'm just not comfortable with. Uh, is the way that they are trying to infringe on what they what Democrats and Republicans seemingly hate today, which is big tech, uh, and telling them how they can or cannot operate their business in terms of deplatforming people, who they can take off, what they can censor. Uh, that's one issue. Uh, the other is the way that they're telling uh, cruise lines that you cannot mandate a, a vaccination status. Look, with both of these things though, I think that liberals and conservatives today should start at minimum taking a look at what we're dealing with in society. And when it comes to big tech and deplatforming people, I think the Democrats would have a pretty different idea of how we should be regulating big tech if Ilhan Omar or Rashida Tlaib, or mm -hmm. let's even say Joe Biden were taken off for some of their racist comments. All right, let me go to something you brought up. In the beginning of your monologue, you talked about Florida and their COVID numbers as one of the reasons why you support the leadership of Governor DeSantis. And to be honest, he has received significant credit, especially in Republican in the Republican Party, for his handling of COVID. But Don't there's the New York Times and CNN recently doing articles showing that Ron DeSantis has been vindicated after they friggin threw everything at him at yeah. the beginning of it. But I actually do research, so let me provide some context okay. they did not. Um, if you look at every major county in Florida, the death rate was nowhere near the death rate of San Francisco. The nowhere as low, excuse me, as the death rate of San Francisco. Now you all call out San Fran and call it a liberal city and uh, it is a progressive city and these are far left radicals running the city. But that city literally had better uh, numbers than any major county in the state of Florida as it relates to COVID. And it was all based on policy. So let's do a direct comparison. You have the policies of San Francisco being implemented, what mask mandates, shutdowns, um, mandated social distancing, the whole nine. Well, what was the outcome? The outcome was that their numbers were superior to the numbers of Florida. But you all promote the numbers of Florida as if 
their numbers were superior than the others who implemented policy to make sure that people were protected. The lowest rate is that of Monroe County, that's the Florida Keys, at 65 per 100,000 population. County authorities shut down tourist businesses on the Keys. At the end of March, the county authorities went against the guideline of DeSantis at the beginning um, at the beginning of the next month. So you literally had county officials. That's that's not, not that last part is not let, true. And if let, you let, me, the weeds, let me finish. Choosing. Let me finish. But let that me part's finish. not true. Let me finish. Um, that's according, sir, that's according to the LA Times. So that's you can source my information anytime you choose to. So according to the LA Times, uh, the county authorities shut down tourist businesses, the county authorities, not the state. They shut down sure. tourist businesses on the keys at the end of March. They erected roadblocks on US 1, only the only highway into or out of the keys to prevent non residents from coming in. Once again, against the guidelines of the governor. So while he's taking credit for these low numbers, Trey, it was actually county officials who implemented policies contrary to his. Uh, desire or his guide, and they lowered numbers in these highly populated areas. The death rates in most of Florida's major populations, most of Florida's major counties had a death rate of COVID that resembled Los Angeles. Let me give you the facts on that. Miami-Dade had the largest, had a rate of 210 per 100,000. That was similar to California. Palm Beach, 173 per 100,000. St. Petersburg, 156 to 100,000. Those numbers are congruent, brother, with some of the worst counties in California. So here's what you literally have a governor taking credit for. And like I said, I did the research. The governor is taking credit for counties implementing policies contrary to his spoken desire and guidelines. And because of those policies, they had a decrease in COVID infections. Now he takes credit for the entire state as if it was his singular policy that created a better outcome than other states. Come on, man, you gotta be able to see through that, Trey. The whole premise of this, I'm sorry, but let me just share with you. Okay. Being a Floridian living in Florida, watching this unfold every minute and covering it in the news, is that Governor Ron DeSantis, he governed somewhat like this. When all of this began to hit, he said, Look, I'm in Tallahassee, and I don't believe in a one size fits all approach. What I want to do as the governor of this state is allow Miami Dade. To make choices for their county, which is densely populated with big cities like Miami uh, and just north of them in Broward County in Fort Lauderdale. I want you municipalities and counties to do what you need to do because your rules are going to be very, very different from the rules in Central Florida where it's rural and nobody even lives near each other for you know miles and miles and miles. Contrary to the reporting that, that, that you have heard that has been put out by the national media, Governor DeSantis was and he was even hit for it. But contrary to what you're saying about what he wanted or what his guidelines were, he didn't put out any guidelines except to say, I'm not doing a tyrannical Gavin Newsom, Andrew Cuomo statewide <laughs> lockdown because I know that our state has different pockets with different areas of density and population. I want your local officials who know your local area the best to make the decisions that are best for your community. And that's what happened, and that happened quite frankly, Dr. Rishi, for for months. It was only more recently, like within the last maybe month, that eventually Governor DeSantis and Republican lawmakers did something which again, I take issue with. They told local jurisdictions, you cannot find, you cannot mandate masks anymore. And I think that's bull crap, but it went against what Governor Ron DeSantis did from the beginning. And I love what Ron did. What Ron did was the way, quite frankly, <laughs> Washington should work. And to start telling our states, you know what's best for you. Oh, state. come on, man. We don't know jack squat in DC. Come on, man. The guy was schizophrenic on the policy. He comes out in one speech, he says counties are best able to make these decisions. A lot of what you see in the positive aspect of the numbers being low. Uh, was because of Democrats uh, in these counties making rules, making mandates. 
so that they could decrease their numbers. He then takes credit for what democratic policies did in the state and he turns around and gives them a mandate that he said he would not give them. Come on, Trey. But, but that's discrediting what was happening in all of the other counties. And there's another big picture to this. <laughs> Let's take a look at all of the- What, what policy did he implement? Just answer oh, this yeah. one question. What policy did he implement that led directly to the lower numbers of COVID in those democratically controlled counties in Florida? He did nothing. <laughs> exactly. What I, mean by I that, think I can move on I mean now, brother. <laughs> yeah, no, but he's listen. taking all the damn credit, Trey. Come on, man. Be genuine about it. I, I'm, of course, dude, I don't come on here and not be genuine. I'm telling you that Governor DeSantis' style of doing this, he was the best in the freaking country. He was better than Newsom, way better than Cuomo in the way that he handled this. He did what, quite frankly, Washington DC should be doing today, which is leaving decisions up to the states, more power okay, to the states. But that's not what he's doing different. now. That's not what he's doing now. He is literally, at based on your own political ideology, he has decided through through action, executive action, to take rights away from private companies. How can you say that is okay to do when you also say you are a libertarian, you do not believe in government intrusion, uh, again, and these I'm laws very, are excessive? Critical. I'm very critical of, of Governor DeSantis's stances and eventual uh, uh, pushing in the Republican legislature, pushing it through uh, to begin infringing on private companies. I got a problem with it. Okay. I, I mean, I, I don't. I, I have a major problem with it. However, and I think a great conversation that Democrats, Republicans, progressives, and conservatives should be having in this country today is, what does constitute the public square? I mean, Doctor, you're telling me that you wouldn't be pretty pissed if uh, if a Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, or even Joe Biden or whoever got deplatformed from Twitter, Facebook. And whatnot, where these are very powerful tools for politicians to get their message across. Yeah, it depends on what they've said, brother. So if they said something that has incited violence, if they say things that are racist, are riotous, I would agree that they need to be taken off the platform. Uh, come on. Well, man. maybe another day we debate. Yeah, uh, come on Yohan now. Omar and Rashida Tlaib's comments about Jewish people. Okay, all right, we'll do that next debate when you come uh, back on. I only have a few <laughs> minutes left with you. I got um, let me go back to another dynamic connected to uh, your friend, Governor DeSantis. Uh, I think you do believe that racism exists, correct? Oh man, it, 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 it exists, it's a horrible stain right. in America, right? absolutely. Well, DeSantis does not believe in systemic racism. He does not believe it actually exists. As a matter of fact, he said, and I quote, um, Systemic policies that perp that perpetrate racism and the conversation of systemic racism is absolute. And he used this terminology, horse manure. Do you agree with DeSantis that systemic racism is horse manure? No, I don't. I don't know any of the context of of Governor DeSantis saying that. He said, I, I just told you. He said I, it was I, horse I know, manure. I don't know the context of it though, Doctor. Uh -huh. Look, Ron is a good man. And and I consider him a friend. I'm He's not on here to argue, brother. I know that he, he so probably is a decent guy to you. Policy racism. I don't know the context Policy. of that, but <clears throat> he has not implemented any or pushed for any policy in the state of Florida that is racist in any way, shape, or a form. A damn if you lie. Want to talk about voter laws. I'm damn gonna, lie. Damn lie. Let me tell how? you the policies that he has pushed that are in fact racial. Voter biased. ID. Nope, I'm not even talking about that. I ain't got right. time to school you on that because I have All a right. limited time on my show. But let me school you on something he recently did. The uh, making it a felony to protest traffic or to protest and block traffic. He did this one day before the George Floyd verdict where Black Lives Matter, uh, they were organizing events all across the state. So he wanted to make sure that these black kids, if they block traffic after the verdict, that they would be charged with a felony that carried up to 15 years in prison. You do not find that to be racially biased. You do not find the timing of that to be insensitive. And as a Dude, libertarian, the, 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 you don't the, the find the it people, to be ridiculous to create a law like that. Yeah, I do, I just was critical of it. I don't think that it should be- No, you, you just totally. said you were critical of it, brother. You totally weren't actually law. critical of it. You just said, oh, I'm critical of it, and you kept moving. You're not actually critical of it. 
All right, look, first of all, I don't know how it's racist when when I'm looking at the protest, it's mostly about 20 something year old white male. But it's about That's black lives, protest. brother. Let me take you back to the KKK days, the Ku Klux Clowns. Remember, they killed black folks for trying to insert their own rights, but they also killed white people and they called them N word lovers, right? They got clumped in the same column, brother. So while yes, you have a lot of our woke white brothers and sisters and brown black brothers and sisters on the side of justice with black folk, still the laws are meant to penalize their specific protest for black lives. That is a racial bias issue. I don't agree with that, and and doctor, I've been called what you just said, an end lover. I've been okay. I've been called that when I lived in where I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay, all right, uh, that's a whole different conversation, Trey. All right, let me go to this. I, I want to make sure we talk about this before we leave. Another illustration of uh, Governor DeSantis and his um, his political back and forth. So on one hand, he passes a law mandating thought diversity. You've heard about this law, correct? Uh, yeah, and again, look, I, sorry, but I, I think that all of this is a little ridiculous. Just like the, this whole banning of critical race theory when critical race theory is not actually taught in the so school. When are you gonna hold these damn people accountable then? You say he's your friend, you need to have an intervention with this guy. Come on, man, he, like you have disagreed on, on my show today about 80% of what we talked about, you actually agree with me on and, and, and disagree with him on. Come on, man. But I got a hell of a lot that I agree with Ron on. And I think that Governor DeSantis has been the premier leader <laughs> when it comes to pulling through the pandemic. Even though I may disagree with some no, of No, the Democratic policy. policies are the premier leaders. He's just taking credit for it, no, as we have already look, established I'll, on the I argue with you all day and night about that. Because again, the premise that you're giving is exactly what Ron wanted. What you're saying is what Ron was pushing for. Mm. He said, Democrat. Mm controlled Miami-Dade or Miami Beach or the city of Miami, you do what you need to do for your people. And I'm in Tallahassee, changed. I'm not gonna make decisions yeah, for you But like democratic that. policies, the same policies implemented in places like San Francisco and others are the reason why Florida had this cumulative average lower than many, than most states in the US. So at some point DeSantis should be authentic about his proclamation and say it wasn't my policy. It was my allowance of others but essentially to make the it decision. Was, it was no, his he's policy. Take, come on, man. And, he's and ready. you know, the, the, the bigger picture to all of this, though, too, mm -hmm. is all of the peripheral that has come with with the the lockdowns, the mental health issues, okay. the drug and alcohol abuse, the domestic abuse. Okay. I was I was recently in Massachusetts talking to family who's a teacher there of middle schoolers. 13 year old kids attempting suicide, multiple in her classroom. Why? Because of all of this peripheral crap that we had from the yeah. lockdown. And, and, that, that and that's, that's like been a Newsom horrible. And Cuomo mandated. Yeah, okay, that's been a very, very horrible byproduct of all of this, brother. So I'm yeah. with you on that, on that argument. Uh, before I let you go, we're almost out of time. Uh, let's talk about this straw poll. DeSantis ah, yep. actually won a straw poll. I mean, it was like less than 1%. Uh, or right at you know one percent plus uh, against uh, other Republicans. This was uh, kind of a grassroots straw poll uh, done by a conservative group. They put up thirty candidates and they say, "Hey, um, who's your favorite Republican?" And DeSantis beat Donald Trump barely. He beat Donald yep. Trump in this straw poll. Uh, what are your thoughts about that straw poll? Do you All think right. it actually says something about his popularity, or is it a big nothing burger? <laughs> Yeah, so for now, this is me just being a political animal. So for you watching right now, straw polls generally don't mean jack. They don't mean anything at all. Uh, they're not scientific. It's just a group of people who happen to be in a room at that time. The only thing that I would indicate is sometimes what straw polls can do is begin to show a groundswell among conservative or liberal activists with, you know, depending where you're doing the straw poll. Uh, and when you have people like that that are very passionate and into what they're doing, especially out of the state of Florida, it maybe indicates that, well, I think it does indicate that Governor DeSantis's popularity, by the way, doctor, with Republicans and Democrats here in the state of Florida, <laughs> I think undoubtedly is okay. picking up in terms of Republicans across the United States. All right, so let me provide some context to that straw poll. Uh, only right. 500 people participated. Yeah. Uh, you're able to literally vote on more than one candidate. You have 30 candidates that are clumped in. You can literally manipulate um, how the vote is done. Uh, and also, 
out of the last, what, eight people that they have chosen uh, to be uh, the favorite Republican to become president. They have been wrong uh, virtually every time. I think they got it right with Trump, but they were wrong with Herm McCain, God rest his soul, and so many others. Uh, so this is definitely, to me, uh, not an actual uh, test of your popularity nationally. But that has not stopped your dear friend and his team from pushing this straw poll as if it is a scientific poll. It was 500 damn people uh, that participated. All right, hey, man. Hey, hey real, real quick, I'll tell yeah. you what's gonna start to get weird and heated up is you're gonna have two Floridians now that potentially may run for president. And they supposedly are friends right now. But that's Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump. Hey, yeah, that's that, gonna change. That Hell. Fireworks. Are gonna yeah, but you already know Trump mad about that damn poll. Come on, man. Damn you right. already know that. <laughs> All right. Uh, Congressman, it is always a pleasure to engage in a thoughtful debate and conversation with you, man. I appreciate you being All on right. the I love you. I love being on. I really enjoy these conversations. Same here, man. All right. Take care. You too. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget. Take care of yourself, take care of each other, and take care of the planet. And remember, the truth is always indisputable.